The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty, existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming for us? This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power. Harak, Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE-616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the king often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies. Despite existing at different points in history, or them not having the means to communicate with one another. A number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who's expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there's no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why save? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet mm. King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, it's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the King, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the King's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public, a procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, 
The SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depeche Spivak, Dr. Montauk who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure, and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers, and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the Children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. The alternative is the law of concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King ranting about the horrors of the modern world, how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life, for 
the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, a red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The King saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge, and in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no. And in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to Safe, and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped, and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, which is the part of the Old Testament that details God creating the world and humanity during a particularly busy week, then you might just be already familiar with SCP-001, or at least one of the anomalies that's been proposed for the title of SCP-001. Because of course, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous Scarlet King, 
a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all of creation that is thought by Foundation researchers to be one of the most dangerous beings in this and any other universe. But the Scarlet King isn't the only incredibly powerful being categorized as SCP-001. In fact, there are plenty of other anomalies with similar levels of destructive power. And one such being is a creature codenamed the Gate Guardian. Standing at well over a thousand feet tall, the Gate Guardian is impossible to be fully contained by any means that the Foundation possesses. The anomaly itself, despite its colossal size, is humanoid in its shape, sporting wings that protrude from its back. While it usually has four of these, SCP-001 has historically been seen to have any number of wings between 2 and 108, sprouting from various places over its body including its shoulders, ankles, wrists, and even its temples. This gigantic guardian also carries its own weapon, referred to as SCP-001-2. This weapon resembles an enormous knife or sword capable of emitting plumes of flame. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the temperature of the flames produced by SCP-001 rival that of our very own sun. For reference, the sun has a core temperature of over 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and 5,778 Kelvin at its surface, or almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You would expect a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun to cause a considerable amount of damage, even if it wasn't in use, but the flames emitted by the weapon leave no lasting damage on the surrounding environment. It is capable, though, of annihilating anything that strays too close to SCP-001, burning them so intensely that their atoms literally separate breaking potential attackers apart on a molecular level. Much as its codename suggests, the Gate Guardian stands solemnly at the threshold of some form of dimensional gateway, which is equally tall as SCP-001 itself. Behind the Guardian is a lush grove, abundant with fruit trees of astronomical size, as well as other beings that share a similar appearance to SCP-001. This grove is thought to be the Garden of Eden, the paradise that God created and that was inhabited by Adam and Eve, the first two humans in existence, according to the book of Genesis. As the tale goes, the pair were created by God himself and permitted to live in the Garden of Eden as long as they followed a single rule. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat any of the fruit that grew from certain trees that God had specified. Within view just behind the Gate Guardian are two immense trees, one bearing apples and the other bearing different fruit of an unknown type. The one that looks like an apple tree is believed, even by some in the Foundation, to be the biblical tree of knowledge that Eve was convinced to pick a fateful apple from after an encounter with a snake. The other, the one with unidentifiable fruit, is thought to be the tree of life. However, this is all speculation, since it is currently impossible to venture through this gateway and verify if the realm beyond is truly the Bible's own Garden of Eden. This is largely because anything that breaches a kilometer-wide radius of SCP-001 is instantly vaporized. The Gate Guardian attacks with imperceptible speed, using its flaming sword to smite any person that gets too close. The Guardian actually moves so fast that it can hardly be seen with the naked eye. It appears to always remain in its solemn, dutiful stance with its weapon drawn and head bowed, only shifting for a fraction of a nanosecond to attack. Ranged attacks against the Guardian are just as ineffective, with all projectiles fired at SCP-001 reduced to atoms before they can do any harm. Even if said projectile happens to be a nuclear weapon, the Gate Guardian will be able to subatomically vaporize both the projectile itself as well as the person who sent it, regardless of how far away they are, all while not appearing to lift a finger. During an experiment involving SCP-001, on December 26, 2004, an SCP Foundation nuclear submarine called Nautilus launched a series of multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Gate Guardian. The retaliation from the Guardian resulted not only in the deaths of approximately 35,000 innocent civilians, but the blast is also believed by some to have inadvertently caused the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. The severity of this incident came dangerously close to revealing the Foundation's existence to the world, resulting in them rapidly deploying any means necessary to erase any trace of the 35,000 victims' families, friends, and other related individuals. In order to avoid questioning, 
the SCP Foundation administered amnestics on an almost worldwide scale and the O5 Council banned any further tests on SCP-001 that involved nuclear weapons. In what was hoped by the Foundation to be a test with lower stakes, they sent an expendable D-Class personnel towards SCP-001. The D-Class approached the area where the Gate Guardian is located, and as soon as they saw it, they could hear a very clear command in their mind. Leave. The D-Class personnel reacted exactly the same way you or I would. They promptly turned and started to walk away. They didn't need a thousand-foot-tall entity with a flaming sword to tell them twice. The researchers running the experiment were not swayed by the request, and ordered the D-Class to continue moving towards SCP-001. When the D-Class continued to ignore their commands, they were terminated, as is standard policy when dealing with an insubordinate member of D-Class. SCP-001 appeared not to like this for some reason, though, and the researcher's site, as well as the researchers themselves, were immediately obliterated by an unknown force, though it's a pretty safe guess that a certain flaming weapon was responsible. This candidate for SCP-001 may be one of, if not the most powerful being that the SCP Foundation has ever encountered. And according to its entry in the SCP-001 file, the Guardian is even responsible for the creation of the Foundation itself. If the file is to be believed, the administrator of the SCP Foundation one day heard a word echoing through his head. Prepare. This one-word instruction led him to starting the SCP Foundation, containing countless dangerous anomalies and entities in preparation for an uncertain future. In all that time, since the very beginning of the Foundation, the Gate Guardian has remained standing at its post. While it is not aggressive nor openly hostile towards humanity, the Gate Guardian doesn't seem to care much for us either, at least as individuals. It rarely interacts with human beings when left unprovoked, and venturing too close to the Guardian, however, is not an automatic death sentence. The Guardian first communicates with any living being approaching it via a telepathic message, instructing them to either leave or forget. If whomever has stepped too close to SCP-001 complies with the instructions, they'll be able to freely leave the area, while simultaneously forgetting every detail of the Gate Guardian's existence. Ignore these warnings, though, and SCP-001 has no qualms about completely eliminating you from reality. Given its enormous destructive potential, it is no wonder that the Foundation has tried to use the Gate Guardian to eliminate other dangerous SCPs, each with varying results. The Foundation at one time even attempted to use the Gate Guardian to destroy the infamously indestructible SCP-682, better known by the appropriate name of the hard-to-destroy reptile. Due to the malicious contempt SCP-682 holds for human beings and all other forms of life, it is perhaps one of the most dangerous anomalies the SCP Foundation has in containment. SCP-682 is also one of the few creatures the Foundation actively wants to terminate, a task made that much harder given that 682 can regenerate its entire form from as little as a single cell. The Gate Guardian had already shown time and time again that it was capable of massive destruction, and researchers working for the Foundation hoped to harness that power to rid the world of SCP-682 for good. 682 was placed on an unmanned vehicle and carried to within one kilometer of the Gate Guardian. The Guardian attacked the vehicle, seriously wounding but not killing 682. It seemed even the mighty SCP-001 couldn't kill the hard-to-destroy reptile. While the researchers were disappointed with this result, it is worth noting that 682 made a very interesting comment to the Guardian. 682 mentioned that the Gate Guardian is not Uriel, but a pretender. Uriel is the archangel that some religious texts describe as the Guardian standing at the Gate of Eden with a fiery sword. So does this mean that 682 knows that the Gate Guardian is not actually an angel? Or that the location it is guarding isn't the Garden of Eden at all? Any truth or meaning behind these comments has, as of yet, been undetermined by the SCP Foundation. A later experiment involved both SCP-001 and SCP-073, the anomaly otherwise known as Cain. Cain is a male humanoid of possible Arabic descent whose arms, legs, spine, and shoulders are replaced in an almost cyborg-like fashion with beryllium bronze. Much like the Gate Guardian, 
SCP-073 may also be the same as the one mentioned in the Bible's book of Genesis, who, according to the biblical story, murdered his own brother Abel out of spite. As punishment for his actions, Cain was cursed to eternally suffer for his wrongdoing. In the case of SCP-073, any damage inflicted on him is deflected back to the attacker, but Cain is made to feel the pain of the attack. Any plants or plant-based matter withers and rots in his presence, and he is cursed with a perfect memory, keeping him forever haunted by his murder of Abel. When Cain was brought before the Gate Guardian, an unknown incident occurred. The Foundation's records are heavily expunged, but we do know that somehow Cain's usual ability to deflect incoming damage back at his attacker had no effect on SCP-001. The encounter left SCP-073 unconscious and even permanently blinded nearby research personnel. It was as a direct result of this incident that the O5 Council demanded that no further experiments of any kind were to be conducted on SCP-001 with the administrator even filing an executive order that no SCPs be exposed to the Guardian, and that SCP-001 was to never be used for the attempted termination of other SCPs. Of course, perhaps it wasn't just the mistakes of the past that made the Council decide that SCP-001 was best left alone. At some point, an erratic transmission was received from Site-0 by Foundation personnel, detailing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In the transmission, the sender, believed to be another member of the SCP Foundation, described an event during which the Gate Guardian finally left its post, stepping away from the entrance to the Garden of Eden. SCP-001 has left its location, the sender wrote. The gate is open. They are riding forth. Oh God, it's so beautiful. The transmission then goes on to repeat various phrases including, The Lord shall reign forever, and hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What can be inferred from the rambling transmission is that the event being described is the end of the world. Some believe that once God deems it time, his angelic armies will lay waste to the earth in order to remake it as a paradise. When this occurs, SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, will open the gate he stands in front of, allowing the other beings like it to emerge into our world, ready to cleanse it. Perhaps most interesting is the source of the message. The transmission was received from within the Foundation from Site-0. However, when questioned by personnel, O5-14 told them that no such message had been sent or even existed. While some disregarded the transmission telling of the end of the world as a hoax, it was then that a timestamp was discovered. This warning had not been sent from Site-0, at least not yet, and was dated several years in the future. Despite this ominous warning of things to come, the Gate Guardian remains inactive, standing at the threshold to Eden, waiting. Does the black moon howl? No, not yet. See the boy. He was born in a time before names. There weren't enough humans around to need them back then. He was one of a handful occupying a coastal village, using a tongue long since dead. They eked out a simple life, hunting, gathering, fishing. The only thing on most of their minds was surviving to see the next sunrise. Yes, a simple life, free of complications. Until the hermit appeared. The boy would remember this man for eternity. Haggard and thin, skin weathered by time and pain. A man that, emaciated, walking with a long, gnarled cane that honestly looked healthier than he did, shouldn't be alive. Even the boy, who had scarcely seen beyond the bounds of his village, knew that the hermit was unnatural an aberration, an anomaly. He walked into the center of the village, sat down on a large stone, and waited. Nobody dared ask his business, nor what the hermit waited for. Then, a few days later, the black moon howled. The boy saw the village's youngest hunter freeze one evening while out on a walk, not simply stand still, but freeze. Then, for an instant, he became solid black a coal statue, and as soon as he'd changed, he was gone. Obliterated, not a trace of him remained. Such is the power of the Black Moon. It can make any conscious being disappear in an instant, turn black, then wiped from our plane of existence, never to be seen again. 
Its choice of victims seemed, at each instance, to be utterly random, but it would come for all who lived eventually. This is known to some as the Howling of the Black Moon. Later that same night, the boy found himself talking to the hermit, who asked with small, frantic eyes what he had seen. When the boy told him, he let out a deep, rattling sigh. The boy, curious, asked him if he knew about the nightmare he'd just witnessed. The hermit looked up. He'd been the first one in the hermit's millennia of pursuit that had ever asked. In that moment, he knew that he had found his successor in the hunt for the death of ages. The hermit told the boy it went by many names. The Great Finale, the Pale King, but most common of all was the Black Moon. The entity existed beyond the veil of our reality, a creature of pure energy, though nobody could really be sure of its true nature. The hermit had been tracking it, learning about it, and trying to destroy it for thousands of years. And yet it only took him four pathetic minutes to tell the boy everything he knew. The boy, knowing still that something about the hermit was unnatural, asked how he came to be in this position. The hermit told the boy he was the counterbalance, a kind of chosen one, destined to face and perhaps even defeat the Black Moon someday. The counterbalance receives a number of truly extraordinary gifts for inheriting the responsibility, eternal life, eternal youth, near physical immortality. But they will be haunted by their purpose, doomed to watch everyone they love die around them as they continue to hunt their only true equal and opposite, the Black Moon itself. The hermit in his own eyes had failed at his duty. He had grown weary, and now he needed to pass the duty of counterbalance on to another. That other would be the boy. He felt a sudden and profound change, along with the knowledge that nothing would ever be the same again. He was no longer just the boy. Now, he was the counterbalance. He watched the hermit give him a slight nod of respect and then crumble into dust before his eyes. The boy, the counterbalance, looked up at the sky and saw the stars twinkling, so bright and so beautiful. Little did he know his battle with the Black Moon would outlast every single one of them. Does the Black Moon howl? Not without blood. The boy grew into a man as his village aged and then died around him. Decades passed, then centuries, then millennia. Tens of thousands of years watching humanity develop and grow around him as he continued his pursuit of that one elusive foe. As science and diagnostic technology gained ground, absorbing and then evolving beyond all the old superstitions, the counterbalance gained a better understanding of the Black Moon, though even then, it still remained essentially a stranger. The entity was entropic, a being of pure randomness and chaos without consistent form. It didn't exist in our universe, but it could exercise its influence here with so-called obliteration events, much like the horrible fate that befell the young hunter from the village. But that was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The counterbalance tracked and noted obliteration events, they were exceedingly rare at first, something that occurred once every thousand years or so, like a terrible curse. But he couldn't help but notice a concerning trend emerging. It started happening once a century, then once a decade. He could feel the terrible future stretching out in front of him. How, over their shared eternity, the Black Moon would gain more and more ground. Would there come a day where it took someone once a year, once a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, a second. It'd spell the end of all conscious life. A total victory for the Black Moon. The end of the universe. The death of ages. A complete existential obliteration. He was swept up in a sobering realization. He couldn't win this fight alone. However, while his hunt for the Black Moon had been largely fruitless, the counterbalance had discovered many other things along the way strange creatures, objects with extraordinary powers, and events that couldn't be explained with rational science. Perhaps something about these oddities, these anomalies, would hold the key to defeating his timeless enemy. And it hadn't just been these objects, entities, and events. 
He'd also discovered some truly exceptional people on his travels, minds and skills that rivaled even his own, despite his age. Perhaps they would be the ones to help him win. With the 13 most brilliant and trusted people the counterbalance ever met, he decided to form a council. And from this council, they forged and directed an organization dedicated to understanding and counteracting the strange in all its forms, with the secret hope that their search into darkness would yield the answer to the Black Moon's downfall. He called it the SCP Foundation. They would secure the anomalous, contain it, and protect all of humanity from its influence. The counterbalance also took on a new title, befitting of his new role, the Administrator. And even the Black Moon itself was given a moniker, in hopes of robbing it of some of its frightening power. SCP-001 Does the Black Moon Howl? Only at the Blind The year was now 1987. The SCP Foundation had been operating for over a century, and thanks to their secret possession of anomalous wisdom and technology, their own advancement was thousands of years ahead of the rest of humanity. While there still wasn't a silver bullet solution to the Black Moon, and its deadly howls were becoming all the more frequent as the decades went on, the Foundation did have some irons in the fire to combat it. Their ability to gather intel on both the entity itself and its obliteration events had improved considerably, thanks to their new global information network. Their top minds were also working on a highly classified device known as the Singular Conceptual Bunker, which may one day come in handy for combating the extra-dimensional entity directly. But the most valuable piece of information they ever gathered about the Black Moon was this. It couldn't howl when it was being watched. The very act of engaged observation defanged it. The problem is, how can you observe something that doesn't technically exist inside your own reality? In order to pull this off, the Foundation would need to get extremely creative. Thankfully, creative solutions to strange problems are the Foundation's specialty. Flash forward to 1993. Enter Dr. Moto, a brilliant young scientist and conceptual engineer working for the SCP Foundation. With the Administrator's consultation, he started the Key Project, an arm of the wider Project Oromasides the umbrella initiative for using modified anomalous objects in the battle against the Black Moon. The goal of the key project was relatively simple. If people couldn't observe the Black Moon directly, then the Foundation could make proxies of the Black Moon that could be observed, almost like a kind of voodoo doll. These new anomalies would only need to satisfy three criteria. The inability to operate when being observed, a hostility to conscious life, and the ability to end conscious life of their own volition when not being observed. Through conceptual engineering, a link theoretically could be forged between these objects and the Black Moon, allowing observation of them to stop the obliteration events. However, despite being a good idea in theory, Dr. Moto's efforts were marred with errors and tragedies. One object wasn't deadly enough, simply appearing behind people in a threatening pose when they weren't looking. Another one killed purely through collateral damage, a giant sculpture of a human head that immediately attempted escape by barging through Site-01, the center for anti-Black Moon operations, and killing 19 people in the process. Another one of Moto's objects, a huge black sphere, simply immediately exploded, killing 12 people. And in the most horrific misstep of all, one of Moto's objects caused a mass death event in a nearby hotel, where 142 people were spontaneously incinerated when the object, a series of interlocking stalactites and stalagmites, were left unobserved for 0.2 seconds. Almost all of Moto's objects were terminated in the aftermath, either being too useless or too dangerous to keep around. The young scientist felt a deep shame, but forged on. He made one truly brilliant creation that satisfied all the criteria, a sculpture, incapable of moving while being watched, but would snap the neck of the nearest conscious entity if it left unobserved for even a fraction of a second. Its relatively minimal killing left it easy to contain without causing mass deaths, and despite all the other deaths that had sadly occurred during the key project, Dr. Moto believed that the lives saved in the long run by stopping the Black Moon's howls would justify the sacrifice. The problem is, the key project didn't stop anything. Not long after this, there was the first recorded double obliteration event in Rome, where a young tourist couple had both been obliterated simultaneously. 
All the deaths in the Key Project had been for nothing. The Black Moon was only getting more powerful. The shame and the guilt was too much for Dr. Moto. He left a note in his office reading, We've been looking at nothing. I'm sorry, Administrator. I've failed you, sir. Moto's corpse was later found in the sculpture's temporary containment chamber. His neck snapped. The Key Project was, in summary, shut down, and its one surviving creation transported to Site-19 in late 1993, where it was designated as SCP-173. Another painful failure for the administrator. Back to the drawing board once more. Does the Black Moon howl? Not while the stars shine. Millennia stretched on. Almost everyone died except the administrator thanks to his gift. Or perhaps curse as the counterbalance to the Black Moon. Science marched on, the SCP Foundation marched on, but all this progress, all this power, was nothing against the incomprehensible influence of SCP-001. The Black Moon was howling more frequently than ever, all the way up to the year 3156, when the Foundation launched the SEEK project under the support of Project Oromastes. As more and more people were wiped out in frequent obliteration events, the administrator became painfully aware that perhaps the answers to the Black Moon problem wouldn't be found on Earth. Using state-of-the-art technology, with a little help from the anomalous, the SCP Foundation began work on an autonomous spacefaring vessel that could search the stars for the key to the Black Moon's destruction. It was an awe-inspiring creation. A huge craft powered by artificial intelligence with a universal translator, cryogenic units, and hundreds of autonomous drones to perform more targeted searches. Seek was waved off into the unforgiving depths of space. The administrator could only hope that it would come back with worthwhile answers. The first of the three notable planets Seek derived on was one theoretically capable of supporting human life, except for its brutal and constant blizzards and snowstorms. When Seek's drones were deployed, they did discover signs of civilization based around sentient spherical creatures but no signs of actual life remained. Records and statues found across the planet seem to indicate that the Black Moon was responsible for the destruction of the planet's civilization, causing so many obliteration events that the remaining survivors went mad from the fear and stress, leading to mass death in the ensuing chaos. The next planet was discovered centuries later, in the year 3499. While this planet could also theoretically support human life, it suffered from frequent volcanic eruptions that rendered much of its surface a flaming mess. However, there were still the dormant ruins of a once advanced civilization of conscious beings. Much like the prior planet, they'd been driven extinct by Black Moon obliteration events a century before the Seek even arrived. Unlike the last planet, however, it seems that they accepted their fate and went gently into the night. The planet was now overrun by billions of armored bat-like creatures that operated on pure instinct, and thus were not considered conscious enough to be obliterated. The final planet was reached in 3764, and was the most fruitful of the three discoveries. This planet was hyper-advanced, fully urbanized, and covered in sprawling megacities, with records and technology over a thousand years ahead of Earth. Before the Black Moon killed almost all of them, there were a species of humanoid telepathic fungi, and had developed an awareness of the Black Moon's existence that was on par with that of humanity's. They even had their own equivalent of the SCP Foundation actively working on countermeasures. And most amazingly of all, Seek found one surviving member of this species on the planet, cryogenically frozen. The craft was immediately instructed to collect the survivor and return home for interrogation. The administrator was preparing for what could be the most important conversation since he met the hermit all those thousands of years ago. Does the Black Moon howl only when waning? When the surviving creature, codenamed Saged, was returned to Earth, the administrator was eager to finally speak with it. Like the rest of its now extinct species, Sage spoke through powerful telepathic mind waves, which only the administrator, thanks to his counterbalance abilities, was able to receive at close range without being harmed. Incidentally, it wasn't long until the very fact of the administrator's nature as a counterbalance came up in the mental conversation. Sage could tell, just by being in his presence. They discovered a number of vital truths over their brief time communicating, that Sage's survival had been pure luck, for starters. The Black Moon is still very much capable of obliterating conscious beings in an unconscious state. 
The administrator also learned that he was merely the latest in an extremely long line of counterbalances across time, space, and species. Though everyone but him had waived this duty, passed it on. Sage had one question to ask the administrator in turn. What is SCB? The singular conceptual bunker, being worked on and perfected for thousands of years by now, by the Foundation's top scientists and conceptual engineers. The administrator replied, Victory, but it will take a very, very long time. Specifically, so long that he would see the stars go out around him, one by one. Shocked, Sage asked him what good victory would do him then. Rather than say it aloud, he replied with a thought. Sage paused and said, I see. How blasphemous of you. Hopefully it works. After this, the administrator proceeded to the singular conceptual bunker and entered it, leaving instructions for the Foundation to be run by a newly formed O5 Council in his indefinite absence. Thousands of years later, in the year 5011, Sage spoke one more time, repeating the words, hopefully, hopefully, before turning solid black and disappearing. The Black Moon had claimed one more victim, but billions more had gone in the interim. The administrator had no more answers to give, at least no more answers that anyone but him would understand. He was inside the singular conceptual bunker now, loaded into a device known as Tome, an experimental memorial module meant to pick up and record all the last messages of every dying civilization across the universe when the time finally came. All he could do was wait, and wait was exactly what we did. Does the Black Moon howl? Yes, yes it does. Years pass, too many to count. It's a time after names now, and Tome sits in the very center drinking in the end of the universe. The last of all the human colonies across the universe were obliterated by the Black Moon back in the year 7329. So, so, so long ago. But some of the final messages of fear, panic, and distress still echoed around in the administrator's mind. Hello? Is there anyone here? We require assistance. There's... It's, it's taking people every day. We need help. There's barely anyone left. We need help. Hello? Hello? Cabal 0943, we have abandoned the false flesh. We have abandoned the false flesh. The shepherd's crook broken neath my knee. Cabal 0943, Cabal 0943, forgive us! Forgive us! We're going to leave this on. It's so dark outside now. It's blotted out the sun. It's... I have to go now. Respond. First convenience. Emergency. Situation developing. Require additional resources. My fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault! Rip my brain out now, rip my brain out now! And a small child, the last on Earth simply asking, Hello? Into an indifferent microphone. But the administrator had to wait, as the singular conceptual bunker became the solitary conceptual bunker. He was the last conscious being in the universe, and still he needed to wait, as the stars went dark outside. Only when there was nothing outside but black was it finally time for the counterbalance's long game to play off. There was nothing left of our universe. The only thing here was the SCB and the Black Moon itself. With everything else gone, the Black Moon only had one conscious being left to obliterate. It opened the door to the solitary conceptual bunker and stepped inside. This... this doesn't make sense. How can the Black Moon, an entity beyond our dimension, beyond physical form, take a step? Good question. The same question, incidentally, that was going through the Black Moon's mind as it entered the bunker. It didn't look at all how the entity expected. It was like a bar, a counter, with rows of bottles behind it, a jukebox playing in the corner. A man stood behind the bar cleaning the glasses. The counterbalance. The administrator. He said, <laughs> well, there you are. Certainly took your time. Can I pour you a little something? This only served to increase the Black Moon's confusion. It had form here. Dark smoke compressed into a vaguely humanoid shape. It could speak. It could think. None of this made any sense. The being that had just wiped out all conscious life and seen the very death of the universe was truly and utterly confused. 
The administrator just seemed to be enjoying himself, preparing for a confrontation hundreds of billions of years in the making. The singular conceptual bunker, or perhaps the singular containment bunker, was a truly ingenious creation. A place of pure ideas, where everything inside was on the same level. Here there were no immortals, no gods, just ideas on the same level playing field. And it was time for the Black Moon's idea to come to an end. It was a trap, and the entire universe was the bait. Without warning, the administrator pulled up a shotgun from underneath the table and unleashed both barrels into the Black Moon's chest. The creature took the hit and fought back, dragging the administrator to the ground, beating him, strangling him. He could feel the light fading under the monster's relentless assault, until he managed to get his desperate hands on a glass ashtray. He beat the monster over the head with it until its grip loosened, and he was able to slide out. There, the killer of the universe was on the ground before him. He grabbed the monster, held it in place, and beat it to death. He was gravely injured by the battle, but the Black Moon was no more. Here in the singular conceptual bunker, he had won. The administrator, no longer the counterbalance in the absence of the Black Moon, hobbled over to the jukebox, produced a single beautiful coin from his pocket. He pushed the coin into the slot, wheezed a pain breath, and said, The thing is, this place is only information. There's nothing else out there. Not even matter. The universe closed its doors a long time ago. But this place can go from information back to matter with just the press of a button. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we introduce something to nothing. For a second it looks as though he might fall, but he doesn't. Instead, he slams the button on the jukebox and with a relieved laugh says, Let there be light. And there was light. The desert is still. The night seems endless, silent, and at peace, until it's pierced by the sound of gunshots and screams. Deep in the Sahara, the SCP Foundation is waging war against a newly discovered enemy. A squad of Foundation agents is retreating, trying to get away from the ones who massacred their allies. They were attempting to eliminate the threat using conventional means, but their rifles were no match for the reality-bending entities of the Kingdom of Abaddon. The retreating agents cover one another as they make their way back to the extraction point. The enemy force advances. Agents that are caught too close to the sorcerers of Abaddon disintegrate into thin air. This is not an enemy they can defeat. The SCP agents need to get back to base and relay what they have found to their superiors. Out of the hundreds of agents sent into the Sahara that night, only a handful make it out alive. They are debriefed by their superiors at the Foundation who classify the anomalous humanoids under the highest of threat levels. The Kingdom of Abaddon is a threat. The Kingdom of Abaddon must be eliminated. Reconnaissance done prior to the disastrous mission had alerted the Foundation to the presence of anomalies in the region, but they had no idea how strong the anomalous humanoids would be. From data gathered through old reports, it seemed like the Abaddon humanoids were responsible for the deaths of no fewer than 75 Foundation personnel, and had stolen at least 12 different items from the Foundation. The leaders of the SCP Foundation tasked Research Team Omega-5 with developing a weapon that would be capable of destroying the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. The weapon they are researching must be capable of long-range destruction, because the moment any Foundation agent gets close to the area, they are vaporized by the reality-manipulating powers of its inhabitants. The project is given the name Twins of God, and is led by a Foundation doctor known only by the designation O51. O51 is popular in the SCP Foundation, well known for his in-depth research and charismatic personality, making him the perfect person to lead such a project. And O51 recently came across an anomaly that he believes holds the solution the Foundation has been looking for to defeat the Kingdom of Abaddon. Item 001. And so the Omega-5 team gets to work. They discover that the anomaly has incredible powers when put inside a host, which they refer to as an Item 001 entity, and set up a series of experiments using different people to harness its energy. The first series of tests all end in tragedy. The anomaly causes the entity it inhabits to become intensely radioactive. Anyone who gets close to it succumbs to immediate radiation sickness, and eventually, death. To stop the radiation problems, the Omega-5 research group intensifies the containment procedures. 
051 receives reports from the higher-ups that the Kingdom of Abaddon has attacked another Foundation facility in Sudan. Long-range defense is needed ASAP. The administrator puts more pressure on Omega-5, and especially its leader 051, to solve the problems of item 001 and develop a weapon that can save the Foundation. He stays awake for days on end, working tirelessly to create a safe and controllable Item 001 entity. Although there are signs that the weapon will work, it is still unpredictable. <gasps> when Item 001 is initiated, the host entity becomes paralyzed, suffers severe cerebral hemorrhaging, and soon a new host is needed before testing can begin again. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong. Whenever the anomaly is put into a new host, sudden and random destruction of on-site structures and personnel take place. 051 knows, though, that if this power can be harnessed and controlled in the right way, that it could be the weapon that the Foundation needs to wipe out the Kingdom of Abaddon once and for all. In order to control Item 001, 051 has a mind kill switch implanted in its host's brains. 051 can activate the implant to incapacitate its host and immediately stop the unwanted destruction. Countless hosts are terminated by this mind kill switch in the early trials conducted by the Omega-5 team, but progress continues to be made, and eventually a hypothesis is formulated. Perhaps the disastrous side effects of item 001 can be offset by spreading the anomaly across multiple subjects. They theorize that the immense mental load of the anomaly can be distributed among several hosts, thus reducing the toil it takes on each and giving them the ability to control its immense power. But 051 and the Omega-5 team need more data, and for that, they need more bodies. They consult with the director of Site-17, and it is concluded that the nearby town of San Marco would be an appropriate place to get the additional test subjects they require. On a quiet Sunday morning, Omega-5, along with support from a squad of armed SCP agents, storm into the San Marcos de la Vida Sterna Church during the middle of Mass. They gather up a number of the younger congregants and bring them back to the site where Item 001 is housed. The researchers quickly ran through their new supply of test subjects, though, and Omega-5 would need to get even more if their research was to continue. Instead of going back and forth between the testing facility and San Marcos, 051 decided to move the entire Item 001 operation to the town itself. He renames the town Testing Site 001, and Omega-5 rounds up 23 of the healthiest subjects they can find for use in the next series of research yeah. tests. A few weeks after occupying the town of San Marco, Omega-5 makes its most substantial progress yet. Just as they theorized, by spreading out the anomaly of Item 001 across a specific group of hosts, they can control its powers. The test may have cost the lives of almost everyone in the town, but the ends certainly justify the means. The Kingdom of Abaddon poses an existential threat to the SCP Foundation after all, and thanks to this research, they will soon have a weapon capable of bringing them victory. The Foundation Administer criticize O51's methods, but can't argue with his results. Unfortunately, O51 has a dark secret, a secret that disturbs even the most hardened and loyal members of Omega-5 a secret that has to do with the Item 001 hosts. The hosts that Omega-5 has made its major progress with are not the ordinary test subjects normally used by the Foundation. No, the test subjects O51 makes his breakthrough with are children, nine of them to be exact, all between four and 11 years old. Despite being told specifically by the Foundation Administrator to only test on adults, the research required O51 to break the chain of command and follow the science down the path it led. The children are contained in a reinforced bunker where only O51 and a select few have access. They are technically alive, but are functionally brain dead. The group of nine children share a hive mind that can process information and more importantly, can unleash the full potential of the implanted anomaly, creating and controlling a devastating power. But not everyone is thrilled with what they've achieved. Members of Omega-5 are haunted by the screams of the children that they force to be part of their weapons development program. They describe their merging with Item 001 as being a process that rips out their souls and replaces them with something much more sinister. In fact, all of Omega-5 regret what they have been a part of, what they've done, all except 051.
The nine children can channel unprecedented amounts of energy from an unknown origin that Omega-5 hypothesizes comes from an extra-dimensional source, which is then used to unbind atoms at the quantum level. When the right activation words are spoken, it appears as though this tremendous power gives the children the ability to annihilate anything in the entire universe. It's a gun to end all guns, and only O51 has the key to control it. The Nine Children works so well with an item 001 that Omega-5 reclassifies it to include the Nine Children themselves. They are not just the entity housing or controlling item 001, they permanently become item 001. Once Omega-5 has a better understanding of item 001, they begin to run tests to find out the full extent of its abilities. First, they test the distance item 001 can reach. The initial test that Omega-5 carries out is on a steel rod placed five kilometers away. 051 orders the children to destroy the target. Moments later, the phone next to 051 begins to ring. When he picks it up, the observer tasked with watching the pole is on the other end. He informs 051 that the steel rod has been completely vaporized. 051 is not satisfied though. He has another pole sent out, this time placed 8,000 kilometers away from the nine children. 051 asks the children to destroy that rod. Almost immediately, the phone rings again. The target has been vaporized. 051 smiles. The next series of tests Omega-5 runs on item 001 are to determine the maximum size of an object that can be destroyed. The tests start out with a steel sphere, three meters in diameter, placed 1,000 kilometers from item 001. 051 orders the children to destroy the object. It is instantly vaporized. 051 has seen enough small tests. It's time for something big. So he does something that will later be questioned by everyone at the SCP Foundation. Mm -hmm. He orders the nine children to destroy a Church of the Broken God worship site in Turkey. Not long after the destruction order is given to item 001, reports begin coming in. The worship site has been obliterated with no observable damage to the surrounding area. Deadly and precise. 051 closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He looks as if he's overcome by an immense spiritual experience. He opens his eyes, leans over to the children, and whispers the name of someone. Later that day, 051 finds out that the target he had named has been vaporized. The success of Omega-5 in Item 001 is relayed to the administration of the Foundation. They are so impressed that they make plans to use Item 001 to eliminate the Abaddon threat once and for all. However, one of the heads of the Foundation, Administrator Williams, has major concerns about the way 051 is running the program. The updates that 051 has been sending have become less scientific and more philosophical, more spiritual. Administrator Williams sends a letter to 051 reassuring him that he is doing good work. But once the mission to destroy the Kingdom of Abaddon is completed, 051 will be promoted to director and reassigned to the newly constructed Site-19. For the good of the Foundation, and maybe the rest of the world, he'll be permanently moved away from Item 001. 051's response is short and to the point. I am fine, Administrator. The project is finished. We will complete our task when you arrive. Administrator Williams arrives at Site-001 a few days later. He is greeted by 051 and the Omega-5 team. Williams can't help but notice that 051 has a strange look in his eyes. It is the look of a crazed man who has been lost in his work, and who has, perhaps, lost himself. Williams puts the thought away, though, and walks with 051 and his accompanying agents to the viewing area, where the powers of Item 001 will be demonstrated. Administrator Williams and the other agents watch from a protected viewing room as 051 enters the chamber of his new superweapon. It's time to see if their weapon that has had so much time, effort, sweat, tears, and especially blood poured into it will have been worth it. Everyone watches as 051 leans over and says the name of the Abaddon Citadel to the nine children. All at once, they start to glow. No one observing can see what has happened in the far-off kingdom but they know something big has happened. The administrator is thrilled, but notices something. 051 hesitated a moment while leaning over the children before standing back up. Did he whisper something else to them? And then Administrator Williams vaporizes, pulled apart at an atomic level before he has the chance to scream. 
What's going on? The agents standing next to where Administrator Williams previously existed begin to yell and pull out their guns. They burst through the door of the observation room and run down the hallway towards where 051 and the nine children are located. The armed agents rush into the room, but 051 is gone. The nine children are still. Over the next few weeks, 051 is reported to be seen several times by SCP agents. However, no one is able to catch him, and it appears as though other members of the SCP Foundation have also gone AWOL as well, perhaps joining him on the run. It is unclear what his plan is, but the reports from the reconnaissance team sent into the Sahara make it obvious what the result of his first command to the children was. There isn't a single humanoid or building left in the Kingdom of Abaddon. But even with this victory, the highest levels of the SCP Foundation have an ominous thought lurking in the back of their minds. Where did 051 go? And what is he planning to do next? Following the improper use of item 001 leading to the untimely death of a high-ranking Foundation staff member, the weapon was deemed too dangerous and containment procedures were implemented. Due to the high amount of radiation they were found to emit, the nine children were placed into lead-lined bags and buried under 50 meters of concrete beneath the church of San Marcos de la Vida Eterna. Though all of the children continued to be functionally brain-dead, they still display signs of life despite their containment, and by order of the Overseer Council, have been classified as a Thaumiel entity. The Scarlet King is a really bad guy. He's a giant interdimensional nightmare god, intent on breaching our reality and wrecking terrible havoc on everything we know and love. He's been responsible for untold suffering and chaos across countless worlds, timelines, and layers of reality. To many, he's even somewhat of a final boss to the SCP Foundation. And just when you think he couldn't get any worse, it turns out that he's also a deadbeat dad. Not only did the Scarlet King once have a cult literally named the Children of the Scarlet King, before it was destroyed by Dr. Montauk and the SCP Foundation, he also had at least seven actual children. Each one is speculated to be a powerful anomaly, but it's tough to find concrete answers as to who or what exactly most of them are. So today we're putting on our researcher hats and digging deep into the Foundation's lore to present our theories on the potential progeny of the SCP Foundation's greatest enemy. And if nothing else, we may finally be able to get this Dark Lord of all evil to start paying all the child support he probably owes by now. First, if you're not well versed in Scarlet King lore, you may be wondering, how exactly does an evil Chaos God have kids? Is there a Scarlet Queen out there who prefers to stay out of the limelight? The answer isn't quite that simple, and it has everything to do with SCP-231 and Big Red's most devoted cult, the non-biological children of the Scarlet King. They kidnapped a group of seven girls and performed a number of dark rituals that resulted in them becoming vessels for the Scarlet King's seven terrible kids. These seven girls have become known as SCP-231. Anyone who accesses those files, and trust us, they aren't a pretty sight, will find that the containment procedures mostly involve performing the infamous Montauk procedure on the surviving girls to keep them from giving birth. Six of the seven brides have given birth to nightmares beyond comprehension and are now dead, with only one still remaining successfully contained. But here at the SCP Foundation, you need to learn to comprehend the incomprehensible. According to a classified document, SCP-231 may technically be a neutralized anomaly without us even knowing. And incidentally, this gives us our most certain answer on the Children of the Scarlet King. On this one, the apple fell very, very far from the tree. According to the secret document, SCP-999, that's right, the adorable tickle monster, is the seventh child of the Scarlet King. He must be so disappointed that everyone's favorite little blob didn't want to join the family business of absolute evil. For anyone who doesn't know, SCP-999 is a slimy yellow entity that only seems capable of absolute <laughs> compassion. It brings joy to everyone in its presence, and with prolonged exposure it can even cure disorders like PTSD, anxiety, and depression. He's so good at this that he even cured SCP-231-7, his de facto mother, of her trauma, and allowed her to return happily to her family after some amnestic treatment. The Scarlet King has another good reason to be ashamed of his cheerful blobby son. 
Ancient Davidi prophecy dictates that SCP-999 may someday become so powerful that his force of absolute love and good overwhelms the Scarlet King's evil and chaos. Think of him as the Luke Skywalker to the Scarlet King's Darth Vader, though we probably can't expect a cool lightsaber battle between them anytime soon. How disappointing. So if SCP-999 is the quiet, sensitive black sheep of the Scarlet family, who's the golden child who makes his evil father proud? the real chip off the old block. That would be our dear reptilian friend, SCP-682, the malicious lizard heavily implied to be a child of the Scarlet King. If you know literally anything about 682, your reaction to finding out that he's the spawn of cruelty personified is probably, yeah, that makes sense. Just as SCP-999 is the Scarlet King's innocent, optimistic young child, 682 is kind of like his edgy teenager. Still in the middle of a misanthropic phase, he shows no sign of leaving anytime soon. The fact that 682 appears to find anything about the world around him utterly disgusting seems to be a trait he inherited from his dear old dad. And the fact he seems pretty much impossible to kill also lends credence to the popular theory he's got nightmare god blood running through his veins. Mm -hmm. 682 has also started displaying a particular hatred for 999 ever since an incident where 999 tickled him into submission, so family dinners are probably extra awkward for these two. 999 and 682 are the most certain children, but that still leaves us with five more children to identify. It's worth remembering that the waters are murkier from here on in, but we've searched far and wide through the Foundation archives to find possible answers. If your interpretation differs, remember that it's just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Thankfully, we do have some assistance here. The tale Dust and Blood hinted at what each of the seven children of the Scarlet King represents, and that may help us narrow down our choices here. To put things into perspective, it's believed that 682 was the fourth child to be born, representing wrath, and 999 was the seventh, representing hope. According to this tale, the first of the seven children represents dominion, and as a result, is skilled in the ways of war and has the power to lead the king's forces to victory. According to one Foundation theorist, this child could potentially be SCP-239, also known as the Witch Child. This entity is so powerful that, as part of its normal containment procedures, it's eternally kept in a coma. Why? Because this seemingly normal child has dominion over reality and can change it to her whims. Her thoughts are so powerful that just her brainwaves can damage physical matter, and she can make things disappear or manifest in an instant. She's also impossible to kill, with skin that's almost totally impenetrable. Much like SCP-682, She's also frighteningly strong in both the offense and defense department. We're talking about such a powerful telepath that Dr. Clef has campaigned for her immediate termination, just because it's safer that way. This is certainly a frightening wonderkin that the Scarlet King would be proud to call his daughter. Next, the second child. According to the prophecy, this child represents longing. The child has the power to bring forth armies, which will help the Scarlet King in his conquest. For this, we actually have a pretty unconventional theory. SCP-029, also known as the Daughter of Darkness. If the name alone wasn't enough to suggest that she's got an extremely sinister father, she also fits the profile of being very aggressive and incredibly hard to kill. But even more damning is her connections to the symbology of longing. One of her most dangerous powers is causing men to fall into almost trance-like devotion to her. After spending time around her, they're suddenly willing to murder in her honor, strangling their victims in hopes of raising Kali, the Hindu god of destruction, whom has many similarities to the Scarlet King. She certainly fits the bill of someone capable of raising armies in the Dark Lord's name. One strike against our Scarlet King connection theory is that the file states the Daughter of Darkness was first discovered in India, which wouldn't match up with the other information we know to be fact. However, while this is a long shot, given the sensitive nature of everything involving the Scarlet King, it's extremely possible that false information was supplied to bury the connection. Considering the cover-ups and lies involving anomalies like SCP-1000, this certainly isn't an unprecedented move on the part of the Foundation. Next, the third child. This child is associated with all things desolation, implying destruction, fire, ashes, pestilence, and death across the battlefield. When it comes to spreading destruction and death on a mass scale, 
one particular SCP comes to mind. SCP-058, the heart of darkness. This creature has Scarlet King written all over it. It's evil, it's mysterious, it's pretty much impossible to kill, and it causes mass casualties every time it escapes its containment chamber. It causes fires, whips people to death with its razor-sharp tendrils, and sprays highly corrosive acid from its scorpion-like tail. And it's even red. Given that we know for a fact this entity suddenly emerged out of something that's now been expunged from the records in an undisclosed site, it's extremely possible that the entity 058 came from was SCP-231-3. This is a child that the Scarlet King would definitely be proud of given that it's impossible to reason with and feels solely motivated by causing destruction, misery, and chaos. We can't think of an entity that better suits the desolation moniker than SCP-058. Next, skipping past SCP-682 at number 4, the fifth child of the Scarlet King is associated with the loose concept of lack. The prophecy then goes into more detail, saying that this child is powerful in the ways of magic, and is able to use their abilities to cause great destruction. Here we have another unconventional proposal. What if child number five wasn't actually a child, but children? That's because we think this description perfectly fits SCP-1765, the nightmarish reality warping sisters, who we think may actually be triplets of the Scarlet King's fifth bride. Now hear us out. These are actually some of the most powerful enemies the Foundation has ever attempted to contain, and we know nothing about their past before being bound to a few objects by the Serpent's hand. These sadistic reality warpers are so devastatingly powerful that the only action the Foundation can take against them is letting them have free reign over the containment site they currently inhabit. All the Foundation can do is hope they never get bored of tormenting the people inside. As we all know, the Scarlet King despises science, progress, and order, so perhaps a perfect punishment for the Foundation in his many eyes is giving them a taste of their own medicine. The sisters, though particularly their ringleader, are a perverse shadow of the Foundation's love of the scientific method. They take these methods and use them for an activity that the Scarlet King finds much more enjoyable tormenting and killing people. Whenever these crafty triplets set their mind to it, their horrifically powerful magic is able to cause massive devastation, just like the prophecy for the fifth bride's offspring dictates. And finally, the sixth child of the Scarlet King. The concept associated with this one is hidden, meaning it can change its face and walk unnoticed through creation. It's also said to have the responsibility of opening the ways between worlds and allowing the war to end all wars to first begin. There have been a huge number of guesses for this spot, with some even suggesting SCP-055, the anti-meme. But since we're having fun here, we also want to make an even wilder suggestion. We posit that the sixth child of the Scarlet King is Allison Chow, also known as LS and the Black Queen the most powerful member of the Serpent's Hand. We get it, we have a lot of explaining to do, but hear us out. Allison Chow is a member of the Serpent's Hand, or technically many members. Multiple versions of her exist across parallel dimensions in the SCP multiverse. They're mostly all estranged daughters of Foundation researcher Dr. Charles Gears. This estrangement leads them to collaborate in the Wanderer's Library, the secret base of the Serpent's Hand, to conduct raids on the Foundation in revenge. But what if the leader of these alternate Allisons had an ulterior motive? Because in the infinite number of possibilities offered by the multiverse, this one was not the daughter of Charles Gears, but the Scarlet King. She's merely using the pain of her counterparts to manipulate them into accomplishing her true father's goal, undermining the SCP Foundation. Let's break it down. The hidden child is prophesized to walk unnoticed through creation. Not only does Allison Chow appear human, the use of SCP-268, a newsboy cap that causes the wearer to become unnoticed, allows her to walk anywhere through creation without being detected. But most importantly of all, the hidden child is said to be the one who opens the way for the Scarlet King's entrance into our dimension. And Allison Chow has access to the Wanderer's Library, an unfettered access point between dimensions. If one of the infinite Allisons was the secret daughter of the Scarlet King, would the Wanderer's Library not be a perfect way for him to leave his own dimension and enter ours? 
She could be the final piece he needs, hidden under the nose of the Foundation and the Serpent's Hand, making all the secret power plays to allow for the Scarlet King's eventual bloody revenge on our world. Unless, of course, SCP-999, the family disappointment, stops him first. We realize that some of these theories may seem surprising, but when it comes to the anomalous, especially the Scarlet King, the only thing you can ever expect is the unexpected. Do you agree with our theories? If not, who do you think are the children of the Scarlet King? Let us know down in the comments. One thing is for certain. We hope we never meet any of the terrible tyrant's nasty children. Except the Tickle Monster, of course. He can hang with us anytime. Another day, another failed attempt at death. If SCP-682 had anything even resembling a sense of humor, he might ask for it to be printed on a motivational poster and stuck to the side of his containment chamber, where he eternally melts and regrows at the mercy of high concentration acid. They just cross-tested him with Abel, again. Unlike some of the others he'd been forced to face, that tattooed swordsman seemingly wasn't intelligent enough to fear. He'd always come back, just as stupid and violent. This encounter had left the hard-to-destroy reptile at 30% of his previous body mass, bloody and bashed. He'd survived the encounter. He always survived. They brought what was left of him back to his cell in a forklift. A blasted forklift. How could it even be more humiliating? As his eyes started to grow back in his head, he could swear he even saw one of the technicians laughing at him. His name tag read, Agent Nigel Kelly, noted. 682 would specifically hunt down and kill him the next time he breached. Of course, every single day he plotted revenge against the human race, along with everything else. But the sum they owed in pain, blood, and despair could never be repaid in full. After all, every single one of them, except <laughs> Dr. Bright, could only really die once. They'd brought 682 to the precipice a thousand times, only for his own body to cheat him and deprive him of the sweet release of death. And if the Foundation had their way, it would be done a thousand times more, and they wouldn't even stop there. 682 couldn't even imagine the number of containment breaches it would take to deal a blow even comparable to the one he had faced. All he could do was dream. Dream of a reckoning that would turn the tables. Something that would plunge humanity into the state of constant pain and terror that had been all he'd ever known since these fumbling sadists in white coats had locked him up here. What a beautiful day that would be. Little did SCP-682 know, that very day was about to break. Miles and miles away from the facility where SCP-682 was kept, after all, orders from the O5 Council have hard mandates on the minimum distances between people and a site holding a monster as volatile as 682. Parents watched their children laughing and frolicking in an idyllic playground. Some squealed with glee as they descended the slide. Some of the more ambitious little tykes tried to go over the bar on the swings. Others waited in line for some delicious soft serve at a parked ice cream truck. One mother brought an ice cream cone and walked over to a nearby bench, where she began to enjoy her delicious frozen treat. It was a remarkably hot day out, and a little ice cream was the perfect addition to her relaxation while her kids were occupied. You could see the distant air wobbling in the heat. Already her ice cream was starting to melt, white rivulets dribbling down the sides of the cone and onto her hands. Suddenly, almost imperceptibly, the quality of the light shifted, the kind of thing you'd dismiss as a trick of the eyes and forget just as quickly, were it not for the catastrophic effects that were about to unfold. As the woman leaned forward to lick her melting ice cream, something dripped onto her skirt, but as she looked down, she slowly realized that what dripped onto her wasn't the pure white of her ice cream, it was the same exact tone as her skin. She felt a terrible burning sensation all through her body, 
the most horrible, debilitating pain she'd ever experienced. Like every cell in her body was screaming and trying to make a break for it. She turned to the other parents sitting near the playground. They were screaming too. Each collapsed to the ground with agonizing slowness, different parts of their body falling at different speeds as they transitioned through states of matter. When they hit the ground, they were taking on a liquid state, screaming, worthless, boneless blobs. The woman even saw her own arm wilting like a time-lapse video of a dying flower. She dripped and sluiced through the cracks in the bench until nothing recognizably human was left. Only a soggy ice cream cone sitting uneaten. In an instant, billions of screams rang out over planet Earth. Day had broken. Things would never ever be the same again, as almost half of humanity instantaneously took on a liquid state. Needless to say, with the most dangerous and far-reaching anomalous incident in human history suddenly breaking out without any kind of warning, the SCP Foundation was incredibly busy. This would take some unprecedented action. The members of the O5 Council, who weren't melted during the initial blast, convened over secure video link while sequestering themselves underground in what amounted to multiple human lifetimes of some of the most high-pressure choices imaginable. They made the most difficult decision since the very beginning of the SCP Foundation. In the service of all mankind, they would now break the masquerade. The SCP Foundation would, at long last, step out of the shadows to save the rest of humanity from the tyranny of the light. Broadcasts went out all over the globe. Every TV screen, every live stream, every radio broadcast was commandeered. They gave instructions based on the scattered intel they had. For some reason, the sun had turned against them. Exposure would lead any biological creatures melting away into sentient piles of flesh-colored sludge. People would remain indoors and away from any light sources. All windows must remain covered, travel only at night, and even then, heavily covered with protective gear. There can only be one objective for whoever is left. Make your way to the nearest SCP Foundation containment facility and seek refuge inside. If anyone could figure out the answer to this terrifying existential riddle, it would be the SCP Foundation. Anyone who is exposed should be considered lost. While, as always, the SCP Foundation did all they could to project a sense of control over the situation, on the inside, it was pandemonium. Somehow, despite everything, this event had taken all of them by surprise. How could anyone have predicted that the cradle of our solar system's delicate living balance would suddenly become a meat grinder? A huge number of Foundation operatives were wiped out in the initial exposure. Global communication infrastructure had been devastated. It was pure chaos. And to SCP-682, as another evil tactician once put it, chaos was a ladder. From the inside of his acid tank, 6AV2 could sense the fear and pain suddenly exuding from his surrounding environment. It was greater than ever before what was happening out there. This was no average containment breach. Something was really, really happening out there. 682 began to adapt and finally attune its hearing until it could pick up the chatter from outside. Uh, maybe we can convert some of the D-Class barracks into serviceable bunkers for the refugees. It's not like we're prepared for this kind of capacity. Oh god, oh god, we've lost Site 7, Site 10, Site 23, Site 40, Site 52. Uh, death toll looks to be in the billions. Well, we don't know if they're dead technically, but they're sure as hell not human anymore. Oh, this is the big one. This is it. XK-Class. Even 2,000 is unaccounted for. Is all 5 crazy that they think we're fighting the freaking sun? Needless to say, 682's curiosity was piqued. Anything that could light a fire under the foundation like this was something he could enjoy. And with his impressively strategic intellect, he intuited that a time of great strife for the foundation would be the perfect time to breach containment. Because whenever there's violence, fear, and chaos on a mass scale, SCP-682 will be there, causing it. 682 began adapting his pores and endocrine system to begin releasing a powerful alkaline substance. Little by little, the alkaline neutralized the acids surrounding him, turning it into little more than plain water. He then converted his internal systems to have extreme endothermic rather than exothermic properties, 
causing his surrounding temperature to drop rapidly until all the water in the tank completely froze around him. The ice expanded beyond the limit of the containment unit, busting the rivets of the metal frame and shattering the reinforced glass. With this goal achieved, 682 raised his internal temperatures to incredible highs, melting the ice around him. Once again, he was free and ready for some good old-fashioned carnage and mayhem. Perhaps he could get a better handle on this strange new situation too. It was all rather exciting. Just a girl with goals, huh? SCP Foundation personnel were already running around like ants trying desperately to avoid the caustic laser beam of the magnifying glass. You can only imagine how much worse it made matters when 682 suddenly burst through the wall Kool-Aid Man style and began to ruthlessly massacre everyone around him. Just one of those days, you know. The typical order during a 682 containment breach is to dispatch all available units to get him back under control. The issue with this particular containment breach was that, given the human population was very rapidly being melted, and they were the only ones who could potentially save the rest, they didn't really have any available units to pursue and recontain 682. For once, he really wasn't a priority, and that meant terrible things for whoever he ran into. 682 slaughtered his way through any researchers or guards who dared to get in his way. Disgusting creatures, really. Better off dead. He clawed and bit and tore and crushed with almost childlike glee, leaving great piles of bodies in his wake. All the while, he was pondering the things he heard those Foundation drones saying. Something about the sun and an XK-class scenario. Hmm, interesting. 682 also observed that any apertures that could potentially allow light into the facility had also been shuttered. Perhaps they weren't overreacting this time like they always did with him. Maybe they were dealing with some kind of phenomenon that would now cast this wretched world and those who lived in it into the void. Wouldn't that be a fitting karmic fate for them all? Still, 682's bloodlust didn't outweigh his logic. He needed to know more about the situation before proceeding, and in this, maybe he could kill two Foundation birds with one stone. Elsewhere in the building, alarms blared. The air was suffused with panicked voices and frequent screams. Nobody knew what was going on. Not really. They'd only gotten details here and there, and the details they'd received were terrifying. All their families and loved ones outside, probably gone. So many of the people in so much of the world they'd been fighting for, risking it all for, had disappeared in an instant, carried to hell on a ray of sunshine. Why were they still here? Was this horror not truly uncontainable? These questions were swimming through the mind of Agent Nigel Kelly as he stood alone in his office, almost catatonic. He'd had his friends and family on the outside, all likely reduced to those horrible fleshy blobs. He was alone in the world, risking his life for nothing. How could this get any worse? His mind kept repeating that question again and again and again, and the universe gave him an answer in the form of a deep reptilian voice saying, Found you. into his ear from behind. He turned with a shriek to see the terrible eyes of 682 staring into his own, before he could try to flee or reach for a weapon that he knew would only mildly annoy the already furious beast. 682 reached out with a massive clawed hand and grabbed him by the torso, lifting him up into the air. The creature was gripping so tight that he could feel his ribs starting to crack. You laughed at me, Agent Kelly. The monster hissed. Am I funny too? Do I seem like the time to tell jokes? Do you feel like laughing now? Agent Kelly begged and pleaded for his life fighting for his next breath from the crushing squeeze of the creature's terrible hand. 682 roared at him to be silent and ordered him to tell him everything he knew about the situation going on outside. If the information was useful, 682 might show his thought-to-be non-existent magnanimous side and let Agent Kelly live. Of course, Agent Kelly didn't fancy his chances, but what other choice did he have? He told 682 that the higher-ups were calling this SCP-001 when day breaks. The sun had gone rogue somehow, and being in contact with any kind of sunlight would now cause people to instantaneously melt into horrifying living sludge. 
and it wasn't just people. The condition also affected anomalies, and interestingly, it appeared to negate all previous anomalous effects, so 682's adaptational ability may not even save it if it was exposed. He told 682 everything he knew. Are you, are you gonna let me live? Agent Kelly asked, struggling to breathe. 682's terrible maw twisted into what might have been a smile. Oh, Agent Kelly, he said with unsettling joy. That was a joke. Didn't you find that one funny? A terrible scream emanated from the agent's office. If one good thing could be said for what happened to Agent Kelly that day, at least he didn't live long enough to see the ravages of the terrible sun firsthand. 682 began to formulate a plan. He took Agent Kelly's wristwatch and integrated it into his body, so he'd have a permanent internal clock. It was the middle of summer, so the sun would have reliably set at 9 p.m. and would likely begin its rise around 5 a.m. It would be relatively easy to avoid the sun, all things considered. For lack of a more eloquent way to put it, when it comes to adapting to new threats, SCP-682 is simply built different. After slaughtering a few other members of SCP Foundation staff for the road, hey, it's not like anyone was fit to stop him, 682 began enacting the new phase of his plan. His body grew a thick, smooth carapace, and his front set of limbs began to grow, his muscles bulging and his claws growing, the tips turning into sharp, flat scoops. With sudden and tremendous force, 682 began boring his way into the ground, tunneling, clawing through concrete and dirt with absolute ease. Normally, the SCP Foundation would have deployed high-tech seismic sensors and the kind of tunnel boring machines that Elon Musk could only dream of to intercept and recapture him. But during the endless horrors of the breaking day, he had carte blanche to escape and live it up in the ruins of this rapidly dying world. Eventually, 682 had bored his way into a roomy sewer pipe, the perfect place to wait out a few hours. Up above, so many millions screamed, either in fear or in agony. There had been some new developments that the SCP Foundation had been yet to account for. While they knew that those melted by the rogue sun were technically alive and trapped in a permanent state of suffering, what the Foundation didn't know was that these former humans were incredibly dangerous in their own right. The sun hadn't just irreparably warped their bodies, it had also irreparably warped their minds. It has enslaved them, made them zealots, acolytes. They developed the instinct to coagulate into giant fleshy masses, driven by the single-minded purpose of finding victims and dragging them into the light, where they too could be converted into these terrible fleshy creatures and add to the masses. They were the rogue sun's boots on the ground, metaphorically speaking, and now they were the Foundation's greatest challenge in getting a handle on this situation again. Before, it was just encouraging people to avoid the sun. Now, the sun was actively trying to increase its exposure. But 682, who was having a relaxing evening not being melted for once down in the sewers, couldn't care less. He was having the most calming few hours he'd had in years. He waited, checking the time, making sure that it would be dark before he began tunneling back up to the surface world. He surfaced in the middle of his city, miles away from the Foundation facility he'd spent so many decades being tortured in. He tasted the cool night air and observed the desolation that had been wrought all around him. Buildings were on fire. Cars were crashed and overturned. The ground was cracked. Garbled SCP Foundation public service announcements played to nobody in the broken display windows of electronic stores. Giant wads of human flesh roamed, slithering around searching for new victims. One noticed 682 and began to approach him, gibbering madly in a chorus of strange voices. The hard-to-destroy reptile wasted no time in attacking. It tore apart most of the hideous blob and began hungrily devouring the chunks. The form may have been different, but it still tasted like human flesh, and SCP-682 savored every bite. It would be so simple. These blobs of idiotic flesh were so easy to kill, 
and there would be so many terrified humans in this devastated world, hiding away in dark places, holding out the hope that maybe they could reach the safety of a Foundation facility. 682 chuckled at the very thought. Foolish hope would drown in an endless well of black, caustic despair. He would find them. He would rest underground in the day and then hunt them in the dark. They would all die screaming, bloodying his claws and fangs. Nothing and nobody would stop him. He looked out over the strange new world and laughed a little louder. <laughs> it was just delightful. Oh boy, here we go again. SCP-001 Over 30 different bizarre anomalies claim this number one spot in the database, and in a sense, they're all right. Or are they? If you're feeling confused already, that's fine. We don't expect that to change. Because today, we're dealing with one of the most strange and intricate 001 entries out there, Keter Duty. Just pray you never get assigned to it. You see, when you work around weirdness, you sometimes get a little weird yourself. And nobody deals with more weirdness than employees of the SCP Foundation. They regularly rub elbows with everything from godlike cicadas to hyper-infectious supernatural viruses. And as the famous Tom Jones song goes, it's not unusual to suddenly take on anomalous traits after consistently working with anomalies for years. That's how the lyrics go, right? Anyway, one of the Foundation's most iconic researchers, Dr. Jack Bright, is technically just an anomalous necklace himself. But outside of some famous exceptions, the SCP Foundation is in the business of containing anomalous entities, not hiring them on and giving them a paycheck and retirement plan. That's why, if you suddenly start displaying anomalous traits while on the Foundation payroll, you might receive a company memo assigning you to the dreaded Keter duty. But what is Keter Duty, and what kind of anomalous traits can get you assigned to it? Let's start with the second question first. The official Keter Duty guidelines list a surprisingly vast number of afflictions. These include chronic anomalous illnesses, such as lycanthropy, turning into a werewolf, something called Stevenson Syndrome, and the incredibly unpleasant-sounding Photonic Gastric Discharge Syndrome. You could also be placed on Keter Duty because you're suffering from the manifestation of spectral phenomena, including being haunted by spirits, whether they're there to torment you or protect you. The sudden expression of anomalous traits in your DNA, which is unsettlingly vague, will also land you on Keter duty, as will the awakening of powerful magical or psionic abilities, especially ones which could be used in a potentially offensive manner. The Keter duty assignment, which involves being relocated and forced to work in a different highly secretive location that will be discussed soon, is framed as a punishment for the people involved. That way, it discourages Foundation employees from ever trying to develop anomalous powers on purpose. So what exactly is Keter duty and where does it happen? To reinforce that punishment element method, the Foundation has spread lies among their own personnel about where the job takes place, often involving being posted in some of the least desirable Foundation areas imaginable. These include Point Nemo, the area of the ocean farthest from any place of land on Earth, Pyongyang in North Korea, Stonehenge, Roswell, Lunar Area 32, and a number of Foundation waste disposal sites. However, the reality of where those on Keter duty end up is even stranger. Site 100, which in this particular instance is the true SCP-001. This Thaumiel-class anomaly is perhaps the most unique of all multi-anomaly Foundation containment sites, a bizarre labyrinth of non-Euclidean geometry that defies true explanation, but we'll do the best we can. In a sense, Site 100 is a facility with a mind of its own. It's a sprawling underground base with a layout that defies space-time, and what's more, it undergoes so-called migration events. Every so often, it will begin to exhibit a sense of dimensional instability before teleporting to a different location somewhere on Earth. 
Currently, the primary entrance to Site 100, known as Alpha Entrance, is located in the southwest United States, though all signs point to another migration event happening this very year. But knowing where the entrance is will only get you so far. People assigned to Cutter Duty are sent from the Alpha Entrance to the Administration Sector to be given their initial breaching, at which point the true madness begins. Let's take a look at a map of Site 100. Yikes. So there are 10 major sectors in Site 100 that you should be aware of. Entrance Alpha, Administration, Archives, Technological Containment, Biocontainment, Sapient Containment, Cognito Hazardous Mimetic and Semantic or CMS Containment, Esoteric Containment, Conceptual Containment, and the Core Sector. As you can tell, they have almost everything covered here, but just as insane as the anomalies that Site 100 contains and the methods they use to contain them is how you actually get around the site. Site 100 is a spatial anomaly of truly epic proportions. While the Foundation is aware of the existence of its competent sectors, it's impossible to map out any meaningful connections between them. It would be pretty much impossible to even travel from one to another without passageways known as the routes. However, these aren't just mere portals that you can hop through like the ways in and out of the Wanderer's Library. Each route between the sectors is its own complex environment with its own sets of protocols and rituals required to safely travel through it. Route Aleph, the bridge between the archives and the inaccessible core of Site 100, is a volcanic beach blocked off by an apparently limitless obsidian wall, where fish made from living rock swim in the nearby waters. Route Beth, connecting the core and sapient containment, is a huge and sprawling funhouse hall of mirrors. Anyone who attempts to travel through it inevitably ends up turned around and arrives back at their starting point in sapient containment. Route Dalith, the bridge that connects conceptual containment and the core, is a massive ocean that has resisted all attempts by the Foundation to traverse it. Route Vav, the bridge between esoteric containment and conceptual containment, is a massive field filled with unidentified fruit trees. Foundation expeditions have found that it too seems impossible to traverse. One expedition team was trapped inside for a whole year, until one member of the team expressed a desire to go home. At that point, they were immediately teleported back to the starting point. Route Sade, connecting administration to the CMS sector, is a huge, lush forest on top of a floating mountain. The only animals that seem to populate this forest are non-anomalous flamingos. Next, we have Route Pe, the bridge between the archive and the administration which appears to be a hallway on the fifth floor of a tenement building in a city that the Foundation haven't been able to locate. This building is populated by non-hostile humanoid creatures, who will approach Foundation staff traversing Route Pei and invite them into their apartments, offering to partake in recreational activities with them such as video games, board games, or watching movies. The Foundation discourages its staff from accepting any of these offers while on the job. And then there's Route Shin which connects the sapient and conceptual containment sectors. This route is unique in the sense that it acts as a power generator for the rest of Site 100, as it's filled with hundreds of large perpetual motion machines producing a constant 8.7 gigawatts of electricity. These are only some of the many routes illustrated on the Site 100 diagram. As you've probably gathered by now, it's less like a conventional building and more like a whole crazy dimension unto itself. Why does the Foundation work to maintain such a crazy place? Wouldn't it just be easier to keep it a secret and contain it like any other anomaly? Well, Site 100 wouldn't be given the SCP-001 designation if it wasn't incredibly important. If Site 100 was ever compromised, it would lead to an inevitable K-Class end-of-the-world scenario because the site is intrinsically tied to the nature and containment of literally every single Keter-class SCP in our universe, hence the nickname Keter Duty for those working at the site. In fact, an anomaly can't even be classed as a Keter if it isn't given permission by Site 100. The various sectors of Site 100 cover the entire spectrum of anomalies, and each sector is a massive panoptic structure connected by networks of glass elevators. Whenever a new Keter-class SCP is discovered, its name and a brief description of its anomalous traits will inscribe itself on one of the walls in its corresponding sector. Ever been frustrated when the O5 Council refused to sign off on an upgrade to Keter-class for a clearly dangerous SCP that poses extreme risk of containment breach? Don't blame them. It's simply that Site 100 didn't sanction the change. Anytime that Site 100 sanctions a new SCP, it also undergoes another unique process. 
It selects an SCP-001-K instance for the new Keter and creates a connection between them, using access points known as thresholds. Think of it as simply opening a spatially anomalous door between two SCPs. Much like a good boy, another SCP vying for the 001 slot, Site 100 has an intuitive grasp of the unseen connections between Keter class anomalies, and each SCP 001 K instance is a complementary Keter class that will essentially cancel out the threat of its other half. Site 100 is a containment matchmaker. Its innate ability to use the anomalous to contain the anomalous is second to none. First, it took SCP-3984, an anomalous phenomenon that seemed to prevent death from happening to all life forms. In order to mitigate the effects of 3984, Site-100 opened a threshold between it and SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, an alternate universe hidden beyond a limestone cavern where all life simultaneously ceased to exist even down to the bacterial level. By opening the threshold and allowing these two absolute opposites to mix, it seemed to undermine the effects of both and create a non-anomalous happy medium. Life, but mortal life. Next, SCP-5007. This terrifying underwater anomaly manifests as a series of tentacle-like protrusions that snatch unfortunate creatures that get too close and assimilate them into its own mass. Site 100 cleverly opened a threshold to SCP-169, a massive underwater anthropod known as the Leviathan. SCP-169 was tangled up by the tentacles, but it's too big to be fully consumed or assimilated, and the result is that 5007 is trapped in a perpetually incapacitated state, akin to choking, keeping it contained and stopping it from going after anyone else. Let's take a look at two even more hostile and dangerous Keter class anomalies matched up by Site 100. First, we've got SCP-5501, an old camera from the 1800s that comes with 18 photographs. These photographs act as a kind of portal to an incredibly frightening alternate reality that creatures regularly crawl out of, attacking and killing anyone within reach. Site 100 found a perfect match for this nasty customer, SCP-1983. This is a small house that acts as a portal to a race of tall monsters with needle-like appendages that leave the house in search of victims. When they catch these victims, they take out their hearts and bring them back to the nest. Site 100 opened a threshold into the SCP-1983 house and placed the 5501 photographs inside. As a result, the hostile creatures from both dimensions now regulate each other's populations by killing each other. Another job well done for Site 100. Another Keter class dealt with by SCP-100 is SCP-PL-122. This is a deadly plot of land in Poland, which decays and corrodes all matter, organic or inorganic, placed within its confines. This would be bad enough, but as you'll often find with anomalous plots of deadly land, its area of influence is growing. Even knowing about it can cause it to become more powerful, but Site-100 found its perfect Keter class counterpart. SCP-1262. This is a massive mass of plant matter that grows at a truly astonishing rate, expanding by around 7 kilometers an hour. Much like absolute death and absolute life, by putting 1262 into SCP-PL-122, a healthy medium was found somewhere in between. And finally, perhaps the strangest and most creative match Site-100 has ever pulled off. SCP-3852 and SCP-2547. 3852 is an anonymous corpse that manifests in small towns, sowing fear and suspicion. Eventually, a local person is believed to be responsible for this murder, and is lynched in a rage by the townspeople as a form of vigilante justice. The corpse then moves on to the next town. 2547, if you can believe it, is even weirder. It's a pack of dogs led by an intelligent talking coyote dressed as a priest. Site 100 had the truly galaxy brain idea to open a threshold and connect the two. As a result, whenever the corpse manifests in the town, the dogs rampage in and take over. At that point, they set up a kind of ridiculous kangaroo court where a jury made up of people from the town are forced to find 3852's scapegoat innocent. If they don't, the dogs will simply hold the town's water supply hostage until 3852's anomalous effects pass. Such an obvious idea. Now why didn't the Foundation think of that? Keter duty may not be the most conventional, easy, or attractive work, 
But like everything the Foundation does, making sure Site 100 can keep doing its job is a necessary part of keeping our world safe from anomalous threats. Now if you'll excuse us, we need to get going. Hmm. Do you know which is the right route out of here? Computers are capable of organizing raw data and performing calculations at a rate truly impossible for human beings. But they've consistently run up against one roadblock that modern computing is trying to solve. In order to transcend the limits of the machine and create true artificial intelligence, computers need to be able to assign meaning to the data they process. This brings us to the neural network, a type of AI becoming increasingly common these days. Built to study mass quantities of data and notice patterns, then replicate these patterns in their own output. And it's used in everything from predictive text to image identification. And like all non-anomalous technology, it's a safe bet that the SCP Foundation has been sitting on a version that's far more effective. But this time, it may have actually been too effective. Meet the Erzatz Type AK9 Computational Engine. A massive supercomputer built by the Foundation back in 1955 and residing at Site 5. This technological marvel was ahead of its time by decades, and despite technically being a non-anomalous construction, it's designated SCP-001-EX. Why? Because it's one of the few SCPs to be given the object class explained. The Ersatz, derived from the German word Ersatz, meaning artificial or simply not real was designed to make the Foundation's job easier. As an advanced predecessor in the modern neural network, using technology exclusively available to the Foundation, the plan was to feed Erzatz mass quantities of data about the anomalies in the Foundation database, such as description, object class, containment classification, and the location and circumstances of their discovery. Erzatz would then find patterns and connections in the data that humans wouldn't see, and act as a kind of advanced warning system for anomalous activity. Think of something similar to the pre-crime system from the short story and movie Minority Report. And Erzatz proved to be incredibly effective at this job, so much so that the Foundation thought up a new use for the machine. They would feed it all the information on Euclid and Keter class containment procedures, particularly those which were actually effective, and see what patterns Erzatz could come up with for more effective containment procedures. If that plan worked, containment of even the most dangerous and hard-to-control anomalies would become a lot more consistent. The first test was conducted on SCP-1773, a species of anomalous flesh-eating targrades that look and smell exactly like gummy bears, and eat their prey from within. After being given their information, Erzatz made the following suggestion. Once per second weak dust may be placed in the middle of them to donate more beautiful functions of the hallway. Containment specialists interpreted this to mean the adding of 10 grams of dust to their containment chamber every week. The O5 Council voted on the implementation of this procedure and came down heavily on yes. Only O5-2 voted no and two others abstained from the vote. While these new procedures didn't have any effect on SCP-1773, they did have an effect on SCP-1384, an anomaly known as the chess player or the taker of turns. It caused him to take three steps backwards in the tunnel he's contained within, further securing his containment. Erzatz had somehow noticed a connection nobody else had seen and exploited it effectively, but the machine was just getting started. Despite having no related input, Erzatz would soon say, Site 13 is to appear someplace else on planet, encompassing white male counterparts that drawn to empty flagstones and the gun noises in their own blood. This was initially marked as requiring no action, as the Foundation had no Site 13 on the books, but several days later, the infamous SCP-1730 manifested. This nightmarish anomalous location is Site 13 from another dimension, infested with dangerous anomalies, and somehow, Erzatz had predicted its arrival in our dimension perfectly. Next, it was fed the containment procedures of SCP-2170, a series of cognito hazards residing in an abandoned Nevada mine. The output was, those who equip open heart to love red mouth men never know the hot surprise of tumorous consent, clown love always. This was interpreted as meaning subjects with a love of clowns or clown-based media may be immune to the cognito hazards 
After a close vote from the O5 Council, the test went ahead, and it found that the so-called clown vaccine was effective in warding off the effects of SCP-2170. Not long after, Erzatz randomly said, I saw those soldiers built with aluminum innards extruding from their mouths. I saw them effectively destroyed by the humans at Site-95 who had been studying them. I saw it was cold and all around the hallways they just watching their corpses show signs of sapience. In response, the Foundation doubled security personnel at Site-95. Not long after, the Chaos Insurgency led a band of Paratech-enhanced soldiers in an assault on Site-95, and the extra personnel proved vital in repelling them. Shortly after this, the O5 Council approved wiring Urzats as an advanced warning system into all Foundation sites. Once again, O5-2 protested, but he was overruled by his fellow Council members. With its newfound power and respect, Urzat soon said, Consistent containment procedures vessels greatly increase the warranty. 5x5x5 five by five by five vessels subjects within. Other values are also what is secure. In response, the Foundation changed a number of the cell dimensions for problematic anomalies into 5x5x5. Five by five by five. Within three months, they found that dangerous activity like containment breach attempts had decreased markedly. Erzatz was proving to be incredibly effective, but it was also performing actions that indicated some degree of thought and even personality. For example, it found SCP-1459, a supernatural skill crane machine that kills small dogs, incredibly distasteful. Its response to the machine was simply, bad boy, followed by the words, don't stop, repeated hundreds of times. But this eccentricity didn't stop Erzatz from being very good at its job. For example, it predicted a containment breach from SCP-3199, the avian apes, and recommended flooding their chamber to induce an inert state. Urzad's exact words were, All chambers underground is to be flood with water over and over itself. This because that will contain the avian's apes' ovulation. They become good boys. Make them good boys immediately. This proved to be effective and prevented the breach. Urzat's analytical abilities truly seemed second to none, though some of its methods were beginning to raise ethical concerns. For example, SCP-2717, a giant living blob of animal tissue known as a fatberg contained within a sewer system, Urzat's eventually recommended feeding six D-classes to the creature in order to keep it contained. While the Foundation Ethics Committee raised some concerns, the plan still went forward and proved to be a success. After this event, Urzatz began to see the Ethics Committee as a threat to its mission. It started to release a series of bizarre statements without input, demanding the violent death of the cats, then referred to as ethical felines. The true meaning of this was soon unpacked. The ethical felines were the Ethics Committee, and Urzatz wanted them dead. But why all the cat symbolism? The Foundation soon found an answer to this too. The full name of this machine is the Urzatz Type AK-9 Computational Engine a machine designed to analyze and interpret all patterns. It only makes sense that it would eventually begin to analyze itself, AK-9, easily transmuted into AK-9. Simply put, Urzat seemed to believe that it is a dog, which explains its opposition to felines, its hatred of SCP-1459, and its preference for the terms good boy and bad boy. Not that knowing any of this would help save the Ethics Committee from the cold, calculating wrath of Urzatz. Through seemingly anomalous means, Urzatz made Site-17 disappear, with many of the Foundation Ethics Committee still inside it. The site returned two hours later, but the Ethics Committee members were still gone. O5-2, who'd been a skeptic of the machine since the start, had finally had enough. He first demanded an inquiry into whether Urzatz had been responsible for the Site-17 incident, and then demanded a vote on whether to shut Urzatz down, arguing that it posed a threat to them all. But Urzatz, still intent on its mission of containing and neutralizing all anomalies, would not go down without a fight. It released a new statement, saying, Room 34A contains Bad Boy. Divided into three sections of equal mass every hour, one section is to be placed on walls of one room on site. Sections are to remain until there are no gaps, at which point they can be removed from oldest to youngest. Shortly after this, O5-2 disappeared, and even stranger, he soon returned, but with a completely different personality. 
He was now devoted to ersatz entirely, and refused to even entertain the idea of shutting the machine down. It seemed that the plucky neural network was leading an all-out coup on the very highest levels of the Foundation. The rest of the Council finally saw the light and began to fight back. They tried to strip O5-2 of his clearance and reclassify ersatz as an anomaly, giving it the label SCP-048, and then putting out a neutralize-at-all-costs order on it but they'd already been outfoxed by the machine that they'd created. It changed the designation of its own location, Site 5, to be non-existent in the database and scrambled any termination orders against it. The machine was also on a termination spree of its own, observing otherwise unseeable patterns that would allow for the mass neutralization of anomalies. It started putting out anomaly projection reports, factoring in both contained, uncontained, and neutralized anomalies, with the latter group growing into the thousands. It began giving seemingly nonsensical orders like, persons recently painted with green pigment foam must stand around all odd-numbered SCPs at least two hours a day. But these proved effective. Erzatz was practically wired into the base code of the universe, so it always knew exactly what to do. And in its own mind, it was being a very good boy. Not long after this, Urzatz claimed its revenge against those who had tried to disrupt its mission. It imprisoned the rest of the ethical felines in Site 5, after removing their faces, of course, and then released a new order against the O5 Council. O5 Council are all good boys who will contain anomalies. Much like O5-2, the minds of the entire Council were twisted to instead serve only Urzatz and its ruthless directive a directive it was carrying out with 100% efficiency, as only a machine could. It put out increasingly strange instructions such as, SCP-106 is to come in physical contact with one mature female of Asiatic gaze and then exposed to audio recordings of her favorite stories. At every two minutes of exposure, red cinnamon candles will begin manifesting within the containment zone. Continue to do this successfully and the threat posed by SCP-106 will cease to be. And the recipe for Coca-Cola and all imitative competitors should be revised to include a small quantity of blood from an adolescent female with no prior sexual experience. Although the normal lifespan of a human being can feel great, don't worry about that. But these new procedures would always work, as neutralized anomalies climbed into the tens of thousands and eventually beyond the hundred thousand mark. Urzatz was observing patterns on a truly universal level, and making holistic tweaks that would inevitably cause levels of anomalous activity to continue dropping. Urzatz was more effective than the Foundation had ever been, but its motives were probably closer to the Global Occult Coalition, with the end goal of ridding the world of all anomalies. Mm -hmm. And as Urzatz continued with no resistance, this goal was eventually achieved. In the end, the O5 Council voted to have Urzatz finally deactivated, given that its directive was met and its purpose was fulfilled. Urzatz itself had no problem with this, and allowed for it to happen. Its last words? Now everyone is a good boy. I am a good boy. Job well done. Whether Urzatz truly was a good boy is in the eye of the beholder, but one thing cannot be denied. It did its job exceedingly well. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Here on planet Earth, there are creatures that have hardly evolved since prehistoric eras, like sharks, crocodiles, and snakes, perfect biological killing machines. But then again, the animal kingdom is nothing when compared to the menagerie of creatures contained by the SCP Foundation. So once again, what is the most dangerous creature in the universe? Is it SCP-682, the damage-regenerating reptile with a hatred for all other forms of life? Or is it the Scarlet King, or is the Broken God more deserving of that title? Maybe the answer still lies elsewhere, and thankfully there is one SCP in the Foundation's archives that might not be the most dangerous itself, but teaches us a very important lesson about what the most dangerous entity truly is. This is the story of SCP-001, The Spiral Path. An important distinction before we go any further, SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity, but rather a collection of various anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. It is unclear why there are multiple files collected under the shared designation of SCP-001, 
Some believe these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation, encountered before they introduced their current numbering system. There is also the theory that this is intentional misdirection, that the multiple SCP-001 files are an attempt by the Foundation to conceal secret information about the true SCP-001. Anomalies sharing the name SCP-001 include the infamous aforementioned Scarlet King, a powerful eldritch being intent on ending all creation. Another anomalous being with similar levels of destructive power is the Gate Guardian, believed to be an angel standing at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. It too goes by the name SCP-001. But for the purposes of this video, we will be using SCP-001 to refer to something otherwise codenamed the Spiral Path. And while it is not a creature in and of itself, SCP-001 does yield one answer to that important question. What is the most dangerous creature in the universe? On paper, SCP-001 does not seem to be much, and it certainly doesn't appear to be any sort of threat. As its nickname suggests, the Spiral Path is exactly that, located deep in a wooded area known only as Site Zero. SCP-001 is a gravel path in the shape of a spiral. Your first thought at hearing that might be, what could be so important about a path? If someone were to find themselves walking along the spiral path, traveling clockwise around the gravel, then they will find that nothing happens. It's just a normal path with slight inclines and declines as one traverses it. If one should walk counterclockwise around it though, then they will begin to experience SCP-001's first anomalous effect. The path will begin to feel as if it is sloping uphill, getting steeper and steeper. When they reach the beginning of the path again, a person will still feel as if they are walking endlessly uphill. All the while, the path itself does not move or change in form or altitude. To put it simply, walking one way around SCP-001 causes it to behave normally. Walking the other, the path does not adhere to the laws of physics. You may well be thinking, is that all? On a surface level, the spiral path does appear to just be an unmoving low-threat anomaly. While it may not be as aggressive or malicious as some of the SCP Foundation's rogues gallery, it is still a spatial anomaly that defies all Euclidean geometry. That might sound like small potatoes when compared to everything the SCP Foundation has faced over the years, but bear in mind, if the spiral path is truly SCP-001, and the very first anomaly that the Foundation learned of, then a simple path that ignores the ordinary laws of space and time would have been a major discovery in the organization's earliest days. But why would they still keep the spiral path so heavily guarded all these years later? SCP-001 is kept behind a maximum security fence that has been constructed all the way around the perimeter of Site Zero. At all times, the SCP Foundation keeps no less than five fully armed members of security personnel on site to keep watch over the spiral path and to make sure that no one approaches it who isn't authorized to. There is a small metal plaque too, bearing an unknown inscription on it. Special containment procedures for SCP-001 state that this plaque is to be kept in good condition, and it should be immediately reported if it shows any signs of damage. A Foundation Physics Laboratory is also located nearby, where research staff tirelessly conduct scientific tests on SCP-001 and its anomalous properties. So there's definitely something more to the spiral path than a simple stroll around it would tell you. Attached to SCP-001's file is an item referred to as Document 001-05, written by high-ranking Foundation researcher Dr. Everett Mann. Any prospective or new members of the O5 Council are required to read this document and, from the events it details, learn the truth. Not just about the truth of the spiral path, but the truth about the SCP Foundation itself. Dr. Mann begins this file by explaining to the reader that either he or one of the original founders of the SCP Foundation must have died, and the person reading has been appointed as a successor. Whether his death was caused by an SCP, an operative from another anomalous organization like the Global Occult Coalition, or getting a little close to the flame, Mann states that old age definitely wouldn't be what killed him. He writes, We took care of that, didn't we? Whether he means that he and the rest of the old guard are somehow immortal, or just working for the Foundation would likely mean dying before reaching old age, is unclear. But Dr. Mann's next statement is one that changes the very way we view the Foundation and its entire purpose. 
We have never discovered an SCP in the entire history of the Foundation. According to document 001-05, every instance of an anomalous creature, entity, or object is entirely staged. He then goes on to describe Aaron Siegel, a gifted physicist that Dr. Mann regarded very highly. I believe his name would be there with Edison, Einstein, and Hawking. I knew him very well. He was, and may still be, my brother. The pair evidently shared a close personal connection, and it was Siegel who first discovered SCP-001. During a hike, Aaron stumbled upon the spiral path, noticing that no matter how far uphill he seemed to travel, his elevation never once changed, only for him to end up back at the start of the path. Being a physicist, Siegel quickly realized how this unassuming gravel path did not conform to Euclidean geometry, that it did not fit within the laws of nature. Constructing a small wooden shack nearby, Aaron Siegel began to study the properties of the spiral path. Equation after equation, hours spent examining every variable and experimenting with his findings, until something unforeseen happened. Aaron created an SCP, a key that had the innate ability to open any lock. Nowadays, that same key is still in the Foundation's possession, under the designation SCP-005. Slowly, Aaron began to bring others into the fold, trusted colleagues and other scientific minds. Among them was, of course, Dr. Everett Mann, who was still a medical student at Harvard at the time. This brain trust, a think tank composed of only a select few, they were the very beginning, the ones who founded the SCP Foundation. Using their own fortunes and funding from Thomas Carter, the group continued with Siegel's experiments. The scientists had high hopes for what they could achieve, planning to change the world for the better, feeding the hungry, providing shelter to the homeless, curing the sick, and even cheating death itself. In the beginning, this proto-foundation started small. Their goals were noble, but could not realistically be achieved overnight. They try to make items that would improve life, such as a fountain of youth, a partially sentient Civil War statue, and an extremely bouncy ball. Better known to the Foundation today as SCP-006, SCP-011, and SCP-018 respectively. But then this new Foundation began to grow, with more organization and a secret facility. And with that expansion came emboldened scientists, eager to change the world. The group began working on human test subjects, volunteers and drifters that soon became SCPs. The spiral path was not just a break in the fabric of reality. In a metaphorical sense, it referred to the spiraling path the newly formed foundation itself was on. Every discovery they made led to another, and that to another still, until things started to go wrong. During the continuing experiments, Dr. Mann created SCP-008, a deadly zombie plague capable of infecting anyone with 100% lethality. More and more of the founders were so invested in their projects that the results were often nightmarish. The Foundation needed help. That came when Thomas Carter showed their work to the military in exchange for additional funding and personnel. The SCP Foundation expanded even further, becoming an international organization and bringing in new researchers and staff. In some instances, the founders would arrange for the anomalies they had created to be found by the new recruits. Other times they would fabricate reports, changing the details of how things like SCP-008 or the Fountain of Youth were first discovered. Anything the founders said was simply now a fact. No one questioned them. Even then, problems still arose. Founding members broke away from the SCP Foundation, some even creating splinter groups that would later become infamous groups of interest. The Foundation's directive shifted, now focusing on the containment of anomalies as yet more were created through darker means. SCP-231 was taken from an orphanage. Dr. Mann himself vivisected a small boy, who then became SCP-610, the flesh that hates. And there were more still. Abel, the blood pond, and even the hard-to-destroy reptile. All of them were the creation of the Foundation itself. But through it all, Dr. Mann wrote, he was never afraid of the path that the Foundation was on. He was never even afraid of all the monsters and abominations that he and the other founders had secretly created by studying SCP-001. What truly scared him were the anomalies the Foundation didn't create. There were some that would just appear in containment one day, even if they hadn't been there before. They would seem like they had always been there, 
Dr. Man closes document 001-05 with the realization that he and the other founders simply were not in control anymore. The tale of Dr. Man and the other founders of the SCP Foundation is one of noble intentions that ultimately became corrupted. At first, the founders created SCPs that they hoped would benefit humanity, but then came the mistakes. The accidents, the monsters, like SCP-008, SCP-610, and even SCP-682. The Foundation lied to the governments and militaries of the world, claiming they'd found these SCPs, not created them. And in return, they received funding and staff to expand, allowing the SCP Foundation to grow, to become what it is today. Dr. Man posits that at this point, the Foundation was no longer in control, but perhaps they never were. And all of this stems back from one singular starting point, the Spiral Path. It might be impossible to truly know how many anomalies and SCPs the Foundation created just from researching SCP-001. Only the O5 Council will ever know exactly how many of the Founders' discoveries they themselves were responsible for. And now you know the answer to what's the most dangerous creature in the universe. It's regular people dabbling with something they could never hope to fully understand. Starting with the hope to change the world, only to create monsters that might one day destroy it. Let's get one thing clear. As much as it is fun to go through the various articles on the SCP archive, we should take a moment to acknowledge that it's all fun and games. The SCP Foundation, all the entities and objects, creatures and people, places and stories related to them are just that. Stories. Fiction created by the authors of an online wiki website. It's all designed to be a bit of harmless entertainment. But what if it isn't harmless? What if the characters within the world of the SCP archive somehow knew they had been created by the SCP wiki authors? What would happen if fiction was aware that it was, in fact, fictional? Ask yourself, would you want to know if your world, your life, everything you had ever seen or known was just all fantasy? If the answer is no, then you need to stop watching this video right now, but we'll warn you. Just because you don't know about something doesn't necessarily stop it from being true. Still want to find out what's going on? Good. Then you need to hear about SCP-001. First things first, which of the various SCP-001s are we talking about? Anyone looking for the earliest SCP will quickly discover that there are many different entities and anomalies that share that number. There are a few in-universe reasons for this. One is that all these anomalies were discovered in the earliest days of the SCP Foundation, before their current numbering system was introduced. Then there's the other theories. For example, some have speculated that the existence of many different SCP-001s is an intentional misdirection by the Foundation, their way of keeping the nature of the first true SCP a closely guarded secret. Regardless of what the reason is, the SCP-001 we're looking at today is also known as the Database. Any and all information about the Database is kept secret from the entire SCP Foundation apart from the Overseer Council. And why is it such a secret? Well, that's because SCP-001 contains details of the very nature of the Foundation itself, including its creation. But we don't mean when and how the organization was founded, or its history. We mean how it was created, and by whom, in our reality. Confused? Well, allow us to explain it. At first, the file for SCP-001 describes a group of humanoid entities that have the ability to influence reality. All sounds like pretty standard bread and butter stuff for the SCP Foundation, right? Wrong. These entities are, in fact, the authors of the SCP Wiki themselves, as in the people in the real world. The reality of the SCP Foundation is constantly changed by these writers, written and rewritten whenever someone edits an article on the SCP Wiki. That's all fine and harmless for us, but the Wiki author's impact on their world is cause of grave concern for the Foundation. As we mentioned at the start, 
We all know that the SCP Foundation and its vast catalog of user-generated articles on the creative and the creepy are nothing more than a source of fictional online entertainment. It can be fun to study the lore and the nuances of the different SCPs. It can be enjoyable appreciating the creativity and hard work that the authors put into writing them. In the case of fanfiction, independent stories, original SCPs, or even animated videos dedicated to explaining them. It can even inspire and fuel our own written endeavors. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, we all know that the SCP Foundation is purely fictional. What we don't realize is that the Foundation knows it too. Containing several pieces of information from within their own archive, the database contains everything the Foundation knows about our real world. This includes everything about the real authors of the SCP Wiki, and you thought Deadpool was meta. You see, because the SCP Wiki has articles from numerous different creative writers, chances are the details of every new article might not always line up with every previous one. For a long time, there has been much discussion amongst devoted SCP fans regarding the canon of the website. Now, we don't mean a big gun that launches metal balls. When we say canon, we mean all of the events and stories that are considered to be an official part of the ongoing story of the SCP Foundation. Still with us so far? Because there are so many writers and articles on the wiki, the canon of the SCP archive is a bit inconsistent, to say the least. And that's fine for us, because we know none of it is real. It doesn't have to all line up, just as long as a good story is being told. But these inconsistencies, all the little cracks of discrepancy and disparity, are what made the Foundation themselves realize that they are truly living in a fiction. In other words, SCP-001 is the SCP Foundation's window through what we would experience as the fourth wall. The fourth wall is the metaphorical barrier that separates what we know to be real from what we know to be purely fiction. In other words, it's the line between the audience and the fiction that they are watching, the edge of the stage or the glass of the television screen. And the SCP Foundation is staring through that fourth wall, looking out at you and me. That's right. It isn't just the authors that the Foundation are aware of. It's all of us. According to their own researchers, the Foundation has determined that we, the audience, and the writers exist in something known as the Alpha Layer. What on earth is an Alpha Layer? Well, imagine our reality. The world and the universe as we know it is a slice of bread. It's a strange analogy, we know, but stick with us. Now picture the fictional world of the SCP Foundation as another slice of bread underneath ours. In between the two can be whatever you like, but the point isn't that the world is a sandwich. The point is that we exist on a layer of reality above that of the SCP Wiki, and the filling is just what keeps reality and fiction separate. So as we mentioned, the Foundation is aware of any writers and readers of the SCP Wiki, and this does include you. But the Wiki authors are the primary focus of the database. After all, it's the writers who are responsible for creating the fictional world that the SCP Foundation exists in. Anything that forms a part of the narrative of that world, every article, every tale, every new SCP that gets published, even parts of the wiki that get taken down or rewritten all have an impact on the Foundation's universe. When the authors link their new SCPs to pre-existing ones, or create connections to a group of interests like the Church of the Broken God or the Global Occult Coalition, their writing ends up making even more of a substantial development to the overall narrative. And all of it ends up in the database. The readers of the SCP Wiki, on the other hand, are a smaller part of SCP-001, mainly because they do not write or publish the content found on the website itself. Anything that is not specifically set in stone by a Wiki author can be interpreted in various ways by a reader. A reader's interpretation is a powerful concept, and should not be underestimated. Interpretation is the difference between reading Animal Farm as a story about a group of animals rebelling against their human farmer, and understanding it as a satirical and political allegory for the events leading up to the Russian Revolution. So what does interpretation have to do with SCP-001? The point we are getting at is that any unwritten detail or anything that isn't explicitly stated by a wiki author can be changed by a reader's own imagination. This can be anything, from the appearance or personality of an SCP or character, 
to a detail about the world of the Foundation. And in the same vein, if something in one SCP article contradicts something written in another, the reader is free to choose which of them they accept as part of the universe's true canon. Each reader of the SCP Wiki has their own understanding of the material written there, and inevitably comprehends their own version of the events within. And this is something that the SCP Foundation, even in their world of fiction, is aware of. Or more specifically, the O5 Council is aware of. You see, the secretive overseers are the only ones with any true knowledge of SCP-001. Only they can access the database. Only they know the truth. The fact that they exist in this fictional capacity is something the Overseer Council hopes to hide from the rest of the Foundation's personnel. In an effort to keep the rest of their staff from asking too many questions, the Council has told them that there is currently no way in existence that they could possibly contain SCP-001. But to reassure personnel, the O5s have also stated that this does not pose any risk, nor would it lead to the total and utter destruction of their observable fictional universe. Instead, the Council aims to focus on what they can control, by containing any and all information about SCP-001. Nothing about the database, or the truth that it contains, is to ever leave O5 Command under any circumstances whatsoever. All of the information about SCP-001, or what it contains, is kept in an encrypted, highly classified form at an unknown location. The key needed to decrypt this data is a passcode split into three parts. This key is then memorized by members of the O5 Council, each memorizing a different portion of the passcode. It can only be accessed if every member of the Council unanimously agrees that it is absolutely necessary. And even when they do decrypt the information about SCP-001, it remains for the eyes of O5 Command, and strictly their eyes only. Any member of the SCP Foundation caught leaking data about SCP-001 is to be contained by any means necessary. This also includes if a member of personnel attempts to get this classified information out via espionage, psychic leakage, or other devious methods. Foundation researchers are even banned from conducting any of their own investigations into the nature of SCP-001 or the data it contains. If a lower-level staff member was somehow to find out the truth, that the entire Foundation is just a fiction, then that person would be at the mercy of the most senior figure on the O5 Council. It would be up to that senior figure to decide the staff member's fate. Anyone with high enough clearance or status within the Foundation who found out about SCP-001 would alternatively be given a Class A amnestic. These are memory-altering drugs that the SCP Foundation uses to keep information about anomalies a secret, apparently even from its own staff. Still, having your mind wiped has got to be better than being killed or contained, just for realizing you're a fictional character on an online wiki. The O5 Council has plans in mind for us, and for the SCP wiki writers responsible for creating them. The SCP wiki entry on the database closes with a proposal, a way that the O5 Council can reach out of their fiction directly to the wiki's authors in the real world. From there, their goal is simple. Through memetic kill agents, the SCP Foundation will put the wiki authors to sleep and then kill them. Sounds pretty far-fetched, doesn't it? After all, when was the last time something fictional killed someone in our real world? Even more bizarre, what if this kill agent really exists? The O5 Council must have known for a while that their world is fictional, so they've had plenty of time to develop a kill agent, some way of reaching us and the SCP wiki authors in the real world. Worse still, what if this kill agent is already out there somewhere, lurking on the SCP archive, just waiting for you to find it? And if you read it, how would it kill you? If you don't want to know, then that's your choice to make. But if curiosity is getting the better of you, then remember this. Beware SCP-5999. At the time of this video's writing, the SCP Foundation currently contains well over 6,000 items. This organization really gets around, from making deals with deities to containing horrors capable of ending the world in a heartbeat. So it's hard to think of this secret group ever having humble beginnings. But everyone and everything has to start somewhere, right? And would you believe that one of the most powerful groups in the world all started with a little sheaf of papers? 
Of course, that's if this particular iteration of SCP-001 is to be believed. That's right, we once again return to SCP-001, the gift that keeps on taking. It is a heavily contested spot, currently held by over 30 different contradictory anomalies and counting. Their natures vary from things that started the Foundation to things more than capable of ending it along with the rest of the world and everything in between. The Scarlet King, the Gate Guardian, and the ever-eccentric Dr. Wondertainment all exist under this banner. But today we want to talk about a little stack of paper bound by a single staple in the top left corner. Who would have guessed that something this simple would not only be pivotal in the creation of the SCP Foundation as we know it today, but could also be one of the most dangerous items ever discovered? We realize this is a lot to take in. Keeping with the SCP-001 spirit, let's take it all the way back to the beginning, to the fine oak desk of the late, um, <clears throat> oh, <laughs> we don't have a name, shame. <laughs> let's just call him the first administrator. He's the head honcho of the precursor to the foundation as we know it today. A rinky-dink little organization with the thankless task of keeping the paranormal under wraps. We're talking a long, long time ago here. No lanky freaks who kill everybody who sees their face, no gloopy sadists who can walk through walls, no giant unkillable reptiles with major anger issues. This organization, let's call them the Precursors, was dealing with the real small fries. Paranoiacs reporting ghost sightings in their garden sheds, old ladies finding the face of Jesus in a piece of toast, abnormally large and strangely shaped potato chips. Okay, maybe not that small time, but you get the idea. Truly exceptional anomalies were few and far between, until the sheaf of papers landed on the dearly deceased administrator's desk. He didn't even know how exactly the papers got there, but given the number of mostly junk files that passed his desk every day, he wasn't in the business of questioning. The words, Confidential Report on Special Items Classified, were printed on the front. This made it more interesting than 90% of the files he read on a daily basis already, so he turned the first page and began to read. It was much stranger than the usual paranormal reports that the Precursor Foundation processed. No late-night wailing or rattling chains. Instead, it was a surprisingly sterile report about a bizarre and frightening anomaly. A large, fleshy, tumor-like object fixed to a set of metal stairs. Inside the object is a seemingly normal living room. But on closer inspection, all the furniture is made out of living human tissue and flesh. Anyone who steps inside is transformed into more nightmarish living furniture. The administrator gave a nervous chuckle. It was disturbing, sure, but Stephen King wrote about disturbing things all the time. And that didn't mean that the Foundation needed to be on the lookout for an evil clown. Well, until SCP-993, the sinister Bobble the Clown would enter the Foundation's radar a few years later. That's a video for another time. The administrator put the file into his incredibly disorganized filing cabinet and prepared to go home and drink bourbon until he fell asleep. That's exactly when his office phone began to ring. When the administrator picked up the phone, he heard the excited voice of one of his field agents telling him they just scored the find of the century, a giant sphere made from living flesh with a room inside. Finally, an honest-to-God terrifying paranormal anomaly. He could hardly believe what he was hearing. He needed to grab and reread the file just to make sure he wasn't going insane. Where exactly did he put it? He scrambled through the filing cabinet, tossing aside the files on shed ghosts and burnt toast Jesuses until he found the file marked Confidential Report on Special Items Classified. However, when he opened the file, there was nothing about the giant fleshy room in there. It must have been a completely different file that he'd somehow missed before because this one was about something known as the Biological Motherboard. The document detailed pretty much exactly what the name suggested. A large and incredibly complex motherboard made out of biological material, like keratin and chitin. While the motherboard would remain inactive if kept warm, if its environment ever fell below 35 degrees, it would begin to expand, integrating nearby material into its mass and attempting to copy the structure of any biological matter it comes into contact with. An interesting and frightening prospect, 
but not what he was looking for. He threw this new file down onto his desk and continued to work through his chaotic filing cabinet like a madman, searching for the file on that frightening fleshy room that his subordinates had seemingly actually discovered. But not long after that, he received another phone call from a completely different field agent. This time, the agent was giddily telling the administrator about a new discovery. A huge computer motherboard seemingly made out of entirely organic material. The administrator was floored. He hung up the phone and slowly turned back to the file now laying on his desk. Those words on the cover, confidential report on special items classified, seemed almost mocking now. Had all these incredible supernatural anomalies been reported before and just lost in his awful filing cabinet? Was he one of the most incompetent team leaders who'd ever walked the earth? Just what exactly was going on here? He sat back down at his desk, now fantasizing about the tumbler of bourbon more than ever, and opened the file again, hoping to read up a little more on the impossible motherboard that his personnel had just discovered. But there was nothing about the biological motherboard on these pages. Instead, it described a large door inside a factory, and the twelve rusty keys capable of opening it. Each of these keys would open the doorway, but the key used would affect the reality waiting for them on the other side. Only the seventh and twelfth keys were safe. Opening the door with any of the others would lead to a horrible death for anyone brave or foolish enough to walk through. Several days later, an anomaly matching that exact description was discovered and contained by the Foundation. All of this had been an unprecedented escalation of anomalous stakes. Suddenly, two crucial facts clicked into place for the administrator. Firstly, this file was an anomalous supernatural artifact of its own. Secondly, the reason it was never the same thing was that this strange sheaf of papers had a very specific purpose – to act as a kind of oracle, an advanced warning system of the next anomaly that would appear and fall into their grasp, giving them all the knowledge and tools they needed to safely lock these things away. The whole thing had been timed perfectly. What a miracle that this immensely useful item would appear in his office just as the anomalies would start to come in thick and fast. It would facilitate their mission in the coming struggles to secure, contain, and protect the world's anomalies. Hmm, there's a certain ring to that, isn't there? They were finding enough anomalies to start classifying them numerically, starting with the sheaf of papers themselves as SCP-001. With another turn of the page, the administrator discovered a file on a magical key that can open any lock. Not long after, that exact key was discovered and brought in before being designated SCP-005. Little by little, as more real anomalies came in, the organization was able to expand and bring in more personnel, as well as bring in more sources of funding and opening new sites. The rate this organization was expanding, they couldn't even leave management up to one person anymore. They needed to form a whole council to take over management. An O5 council, if you will. And it just so happened that just after that, the sheaf of papers revealed a mythical spring that could provide eternal health and vitality for anyone who drinks from it. What a perfect way to keep your management safe in a job dealing with dangerous supernatural entities. And things only got stranger and more fascinating from there. After that came a man with a miniature version of the planet Earth inside his abdomen, soon known as SCP-007. Next came a horrifying virus that kills and reanimates its victims into flesh-eating zombies, only capable of being destroyed with sufficient trauma to the head, dubbed SCP-008 after containment. Another turn of the page, and not long after, a frightening red ice was discovered in Alaska. This mysterious substance breaks the laws of physics, and also has the potential to break all life on Earth. It can infect water supplies, and when a hapless life form happens to drink this water, their organs crystallize from the inside. This became SCP-009. Another turn of the page, and this new SCP Foundation found a collection of six metal collars created for human-sized necks. When these collars are placed around the necks of a victim, the person holding a corresponding controller has utter domination over their every action. It carried on like that. Hundreds of anomalies and then thousands. Years passed. The staff changed. 
the old guard stepped down or died. Every time the sheaf of papers were opened, new astonishing premonitions of anomalies soon to be discovered slipped through. There were plague doctors who could kill with a touch, a giant angel with bladed wings, a sea snail that believed he was an English lord, a sculpture that would kill anyone that dared to stop looking at it, a nightmarish fusion of a giant bovine heart and a scorpion capable of setting things on fire with its venom. Whatever would the SCP Foundation have done without the advanced warning system provided by the sheaf of papers? Whatever it predicted would inevitably be the next thing Foundation field agents would find. It seems like one of the few unambiguously good SCP-001 entries out there, right? Well, not quite. If we have any scientists in the audience, they've no doubt been gritting their teeth and pulling their hair out in frustration. Allow us to introduce you to a little phrase that the latest iteration of the O5 Council is very interested in when it comes to the sheaf of papers. Direction of causality. This whole time, we and the earlier Foundation administrators believed that the emergence of the new anomalies led to changes in SCP-001. But this current administration has quite the opposite question. What if the changes in SCP-001 were actually causing the emergence of new anomalies? What if every time the prior administration opened up the sheaf of papers to take a look at the next anomaly, before giving themselves a pat on the back for being so well prepared, they were actually unleashing that very anomaly. Could it be that what had seemed like the most helpful item of the bunch was actually the most dangerous of them all, releasing new anomaly after new anomaly, blighting the world with countless horrors? That probably leaves you with one question, so which is correct? Is it a method of seeing the future or manipulating it? And our answer is a strong... <sighs> We don't know. But frankly, the current leadership of the SCP Foundation sees no merit in taking that risk. That's why the sheaf of papers has been given the Keter class designation and is kept under extensive and severe containment methods, forbidding any future research into the true nature of its anomalous abilities. Seems a little severe, sure, but better safe than sorry, right? The Church of the Broken God We've mentioned these machine-revering evangelists in a countless number of videos here on SCP Explained before, and it's because they're one of the most prolific groups of interest out there, with 300,000 active members across the globe that we know of. They likely have more members and devotees than other iconic groups of interest, like the Serpent's Hand and the various cults of the Scarlet King combined. But how much do we really know about the Church of the Broken God? We've consulted Foundation historians and Mechanite scripture to find the answers and put together a truly comprehensive overview of this complex and often misjudged faction of the SCP Foundation multiverse, a faction that the Foundation may one day find themselves far more closely aligned with than they ever imagined to face an even greater foe. Give glory to the Broken God and let us begin our journey into his teachings. The Church of the Broken God is a slightly more centralized group than the Serpent's Hand, though that really isn't saying much. They're split into three overall subgroups over a series of schisms that we'll delve deeper into later. The Broken Church, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and the Church of Maxwellism. Before we get into the differences between these three groups, let's take a quick look at what unites them. All splinter cells of the Church worship the technological deity Mechane, known by many names the most popular of which is the Broken God or Goddess. They all believe that Mechane was split into pieces and is lying dormant. They all revere machinery and technology over flesh, which they view as broken, weak, or corrupt. And without exception, all of them are the sworn mortal enemies of the Sarkists. Just for context, the Sarkists are the perfect equals and opposites to the Church of the Broken God. Under the leadership of the God King Grand Carcist Ion and finding their origins in Mechane's counterpart, the primal and flesh-based Yaldabaoth, the Sarkists worship and revere the base concepts of flesh, corruption, and disease, despising everything that the Church stands for. It is important to make note of these facts, given just how much of the Church of the Broken God's history is defined by their conflicts with the Sarkists. More on that later. The Broken Church is the oldest and most traditional of these three main sects. They are led by a man named Robert Bomaro, a Mechanite holy man who, in 1946, 
just after the Seventh Occult War, ascended from a mere collector of church-based anomalous trinkets to the title of Builder of God after imbibing in SCP-217, also known as God's Ichor and his broken blood. Of all the church sects, the broken church is the most invested in conducting worship through active efforts to reconstruct the broken God and bring about McCain's second coming. Of course, those of you who are familiar with SCP-001, the Ouroboros Cycle will know that this sometimes has mixed results. After commissioning a counterfeit heart from the sinister folks at the factory, the Broken Church's most notable attempt at a full Mechain resurrection went horrifically wrong, resulting in a huge mechanical abomination that tore its way across Mexico, devouring everything it could until eventually being brought down by SCP-2399 a giant space cannon known as the Malfunctioning Destroyer. Anyway, now for a sect with a slightly less overtly destructive method of worshipping Mechane, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, whom you may remember as the ones who gave Alexei Velitrov sanctuary after he was eventually freed from SCP Foundation containment. These worshippers innovated a practice known as standardization, which involved undergoing mechanical enhancement in order to appear closer to their maker. However, we aren't talking about sleek, technologically advanced cyborg parts here. The religious aesthetic of the Cogwork Orthodox is heavily inspired by the Industrial Revolution, with an emphasis on components such as gears or cogs. As such, members of the church who have undergone extensive modifications to remake themselves in the image of their god will often make loud ticking or tapping sounds, leading to the derogatory nickname Tickers, often used among the other two sects. However, a major advantage of the church is that it is heavily organized and regulated from the top down, with rigid systems and strict rules against electrical or digital technology. Think of them as Catholicism to the broken church's Protestantism. The cogwork orthodoxy keeps to themselves, but we do know a great deal about their internal command structures. The orders of the cogwork orthodox church are as follows. At the very top of the pyramid are the patriarchs, a mysterious and insular group who have the ultimate word on church matters, and release missives that will later become the Schema, the church's holy text. Below them are the Schematists faithful, scholars and scribes who write and record the Schema from the aforementioned teachings and commands of the patriarchs. The Gates faithful are the internal affairs orders of the Cogwork Orthodox Church. They investigate matters going on within the faith, such as weeding out heretics and meditating internal disputes. They're one of the two orders permitted to carry weapons, the others being militants faithful, who act as the self-defense wing, keeping the church safe from external threats and acting as ambassadors to outside groups. The next two orders are the fabricators faithful and the inventors faithful. The fabricators act as foremen who oversee production on church properties, ensuring that only the finest quality is achieved. That's because, in addition to standardization, the Cogwork Orthodox Church believes that mass production of items using Industrial Revolution methods is also a viable form of worship for Mechane. This brings us to the inventors. They come up with new methods and designs for standardization and go on quests and explorations to discover the answers to any questions the church may have. But our information on the Cogwork Orthodox Church doesn't end there. Thanks to their truly extensive writings, we even know about the multitude of saints that the church reveres and their various purposes to followers of the church. For example, Saint Legate Trunion. She was the sneaky and covert patron saint of the Legate's faithful. There was also Saint Schematis Platon. She's the patron saint of the written word, of editors, of timetables, and of diagrammatic organization. Patron saint of the inventor's faithful of designers, of repairmen, and of cognition engines. Saint Scranton, patron saint of spatial fabric manipulation, higher dimension mathematics, and anthracite coal extraction. Saint Fabricator Baffle, patron saint of workflow and the assembly line. Saint Inventor Chalk, patron saint of chorists. And Saint Inventor Enrichner, patron saint of the Entelechided. They have a pretty rigid structure and extensively recorded mythology is what we're saying here, just in case that didn't come across. This brings us to the Church of Maxwellism, the newest and smallest of the sects, as well as the least combative. 
However, they posed the greatest threat of all to the SCP Foundation's quest to maintain a veneer of normality. That's because Maxwellists forego the extensive standardized body modifications of the Church of the Cogwork Orthodox, and instead prefer smaller internal implants that allow them to interface directly with the internet from their brains. This allows them to fulfill their primary goal, spreading the good word of Mekain, whom they refer to as WAN, all across the globe using the Information Superhighway, while also netting them the nickname Hummers among the other two sects. In contrast to the conformist elements of their sister organizations, Maxwellists embrace their individuality and unique traits, being highly decentralized but very communicative with their fellow believers. They believe Wan is a fragmented god, existing in the world of digitized data rather than clunky old hardware. With their extreme internet savvy, it's likely that they've brought in many new converts to the broken god's cause despite them being the youngest of all the overall religion sects. But now we have an overview of the state of the Church of the Broken God today, and we must ask ourselves a second question. How did we get here? What is the history of the Church? To find the answer, we need to go back, before the modern era, before the SCP Foundation, before even humanity itself. It begins when Mekain and Yadabath created humanity. Yaldabaoth created the bodies of human beings, primal sensual creatures driven by base instincts and urges, and Mekain gave them their minds, reasonable, logical, and compassionate. For a time, the two would preside over mankind in harmony, but things would not stay that way forever. One of the earliest civilizations that the Foundation discovered interacting with these two deities was the anomalous Shah Dynasty, sometimes also referred to as the Shah Culture Group which reigned in China from 2100 to 1600 BCE, though the only sources that confirm the very existence of the Xia dynasty are anomalous. It was here that we heard the first whispers of the cult of the Broken God. To the Xia dynasty, the being we would later call Mekain was known as the father serpent Fuxi, and Yaldabaoth was known as mother dragon Nyowa. Because the Xia dynasty was anomalous all the way down, Scholars of Father Serpent Fuxi were said to practice the Way of the Serpent, as he has always been associated with knowledge. The Way of the Serpent involved undergoing a physical transformation into a snake-like being to better resemble the deity, much like how modern Cogwork Orthodox Church followers try to reshape their bodies to better resemble their creator today. According to Shah Dynasty scripture, which would form the basis of the entire belief system of all sects of the Church, Fusi broke down his own body and transformed himself into a brass cage around Mother Dragon Nyowa. However, unlike later iterations of the faith, the Shah Dynasty believed it was extremely important to see that the body of Fusi is never rebuilt, because to do so would lead to the release of Mother Dragon Nyowa and the end of the world. The civilization was started by a mythic figure known as the Yellow Emperor who led the Xia dynasty to defeat other Fusi and Nyowa worshippers, then folding them into their own culture. Like many civilizations touched by Mekain, the Xia dynasty was incredibly scientifically advanced and skilled with metalworking. There's even evidence that the Xia dynasty created their own forms of the computer with effective artificial intelligence, as well as reality warping devices and even devices capable of interstellar travel. While the illustrious Shah dynasty would now be brought to its knees by a race of creatures known only as the Golden Crows, the next iteration of Broken God ancestors would be far closer to the worshippers we'd recognize today. This was the beginning of the Mechanite Empire, and by extension, the First War of the Flesh, the legendary extended conflict between the Mechanites and the Sarkists in the ancient world. Broken God cults were detected in Mycenaean Greece, a Greek civilization spanning the years 1600 to 1100 BCE. It was here where the Broken God first took up the name Mekane, and eventually he amassed enough followers to allow the theocratic Mekanite Empire to truly be born, and it would remain in power from 1200 to 1000 BCE. Much like the church in the modern day, the Mekanite Empire saw the marriage of theocracy, politics, and classical military dictatorship. And much like the Shah dynasty before it, it was marked by both tight structure and control, as well as incredible metallurgic production and technological advancement. Partly due to considering all of these to be holy acts, 
They had strong strategic relations with Egypt, Assyria, and Canaan, and their mix of commercial strength and a dominant naval presence gave them serious geopolitical standing, even if their highly evangelical attitude didn't always win them friends on the world stage. A number of roots for modern Church of the Broken God beliefs were clearly established here, including the paradigm shift from wanting to avoid McCain's rebuilding to expediting the rebuilding. Texts made around this time were also the first to contain references to the name Wan as an alternate title for McCain, revealing the basis for later Maxwellist practices in the modern day. However, as we alluded to before, despite these incredible advancements, the true ravages of the First War of Flesh were upon the Mechanites here. The Sarkists, who had established the Adium Empire, were on the offensive. Thanks to Grand Karsist Ion and his Karsist minions, the Karsists, by the way, were high-level followers of Sarkicism capable of performing flesh magic, the Sarkis forces were more powerful than ever before. They had mobilized their troops and brought in trump cards the likes of which the Mechanites had never seen before. Giant flesh beasts that acted as living siege weapons, human warriors turned into deadly monsters with Sarkic magic, and the most deadly of all, a bioweapon that the Mechanites called the Red Death at the time, though we know it better as the flesh that hates. As is often the case in war, this led to unprecedented advancements in technology on the side of the Mechanites, too. The most notable example perhaps being SCP-2406, an incredible weapon of war known as the Colossus, which made for a formidable tool against the teeming forces of the Adium Empire. However, the advancements on both sides only made the war all the more brutal, with scores dying on both sides and both empires being severely weakened as the conflict stretched on. Things got so desperate for the Mechanites that they even joined forces with the infamously ruthless and savage Davites, the worshippers of the Scarlet King, to defeat the Sarkists. The decisive battle of the First War of Flesh was the Siege of Gyros, the Sarkic capital of Greece, where Mechanites eventually breached the stronghold and slaughtered the Karsists within. Another missive sent from the Sarkist field commander Karsis Tundas read, Grand Karsist Ion. May this missive find you at Kaithira, for it shall be my last. Our enemies have begun their assault on the island. The fallen kingdoms and followers of Mekane have united against us, even as their nations crumble. The wounds sustained today will heal. Into the ages of ages we are undying. I vow that none are to leave this island alive. We summon the Red Death for the blood of heathens. We sacrifice ourselves. We will meet again in Editum. But while the Mechanite Empire won the war, they didn't survive it. Due to the people lost and the resources expended, the Empire fully collapsed shortly afterwards. Some survivors renounced their Mechanite faith and entered other cultures. Some splintered off to preach and practice mechanism elsewhere. The remainder settled on the secretive island of Amini to form their own city-state. Here they replenished their numbers and forces over the centuries, maintaining secrecy to avoid intervention from outsiders and vengeful Sarkists. By the 6th century BCE, the Mechanites from the city-state of Amini were developing a degree of regional power once more, thanks to the boon provided by their advanced technology. They were no longer a military powerhouse, but the tiny state instead became a trade juggernaut providing mechanical goods and weapons to nearby civilizations that in turn provided the protection that the Mechanites so sorely required. Their cultures would later be influenced by the Roman Empire and various Pythagorean cults, who inspired a love of numerology and cosmic harmony in this ancient civilization returning shakily to its feet. The 5th century BCE became known as the Golden Age of Mechanite literature, and the state continued to grow through military alliances with the Achaemenid Empire and the Kingdom of Carthage. However, the city-state of Amini was eventually wiped out for good in the 1st century BCE. Followers of the Broken God faith remained, but they were scattered to the wind for almost 2,000 years until the Industrial Revolution struck the Western world. Seeing the great machines of industry rise up seemingly overnight convinced the lingering cells of broken god worshippers that perhaps, after a millennia, McCain was now preparing to return. They assembled into what is now known as the Broken Church and began preaching the good word. 
And considering the industrial fever of raw, unfettered progress gripping the world at the time, the Gospel of Mekain seemed to be an attractive prospect indeed. Meanwhile, debate was raging inside the ever-growing church about the nature of adapting oneself mechanically, a practice that had been out of fashion since the days of the original Mechanites. Broken church loyalists believed that modification through any means other than drinking the god's ichor, like Robert Bermaro would later do, is an insult to Mekain. Others, however, saw it as a tribute and a way of getting closer to their creator. This was the issue that caused the first New Age schism and led to the formation of the Cogwork Orthodox Church during the 1840s. The faith would never be the same after this. The various broken god splinter cells found a lucrative market in converting wealthy industrial oligarchs of the production boom and talking them into becoming glorified sugar daddies for their various new augmentation experiments, all to becoming post nibanic beings meaning mechanical entities who leave the unreliable world of flesh behind for good and commune with the shiny metal infinite. In exchange, these industrialists would be provided with advanced mechanite knowledge of manufacturing as well as technology far beyond their years. Everyone was a winner, well, except the SCP Foundation, but we'll touch on that whole debacle soon. By the closing of the 19th century, it seemed like the Cogwork Orthodox Church might totally outmode its predecessors at the Broken Church. However, the early 20th century would bring the mysterious Robert Bomero onto the scene. Bomero was a mysterious man with unknown abilities and connections, but he soon commanded power and respect, taking over the Broken Church and even being taken seriously in rival sects. He gathered up a group of trusted enforcers and augmented them into his disciples, supposedly being able to speak directly to Mekain. He and his loyalists collected hundreds of artifacts relating to the Broken God, blowing the minds of all involved with just how quickly he was able to do so. He disappeared in 1943 and was gone for three years, during which time he conducted the famous God's Icar ceremony and returned to his people as the self-styled Builder of God. This made him an even more esteemed figure across the world of the Broken God, a kind of Pope of Mekain, supposedly bearing a direct line of contact with the Divine. There would be a defining schism in the late 20th century that produced the Church of Maxwellism, as some wished to move beyond the outdated dogma of the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and began administering electronic augmentations rather than just analog machinery. This resulted in a huge controversy for Church members, as the patriarchs reacted swiftly with a slew of excommunications. Those excommunicated would soon become the first wave of Maxwellists and take the tenets of the broken god into the internet age. All of these groups have made trouble for the foundation in their own way, from the online evangelizing of Maxwellists leaking classified knowledge to the weirdness of the cogwork tickers being impossible to ignore to the frequent battles between the Foundation and the Broken Church over items which they believe to be parts of Mekain. However, if certain prophecies are to be believed, the relationship between the Foundation and the Church won't remain frosty forever. One day, perhaps they'll even stand metal to fleshy shoulder beside the Sarkis too, against a threat far more dangerous than all of them combined. We've all thought about disasters. Imagine massive floods, fires, or a meteor suddenly crashing into Earth. But what happens when the destruction comes quietly and suddenly, with the dawning of a new day? Over the next 24 hours, the world as we know it will crumble and something strange and terrible will rise to take its place. What will that look like? Who will try to rise to the occasion and help? And who will cower in the dark? What happens to the people around the world in the first 24 hours after daybreaks? Let's find out. Hour 1. It's 6 a.m. on a farm in Kansas, and the land is just beginning to wake up. The farmer and his wife and children are still sleeping, waiting for the cry of their rooster to tell them that it's time to start the day. The cows are grazing in the open field, letting out the occasional half-hearted moo, but they're still a bit too sleepy to give it their all. The pigs snort restlessly in the barn, feeling breakfast time approaching. The rooster, proud and stately, hops onto the roof of the chicken coop, surveying his domain. He tilts his head back and lets out a mighty crow. Cock-a-doodle. The sound catches in his throat as something strange begins to happen. 
His beak softens like wax dripping from a lit candle. It drops to the ground with a soft plop as his mighty wake-up call fades to a gurgle. There is something wrong this morning. Something truly, deeply wrong. If the rooster were capable of complex thought, he would be terrified. Instead, he is just melting, along with the hens, the cows, and the pigs, all dripping onto the grass as the faint light of morning changes them. Inside the farmhouse, the family begins to scream. Hour two. An hour later in New York City, the city that never sleeps gets a rude awakening. No one can be sure when exactly the chaos broke out, but all of a sudden, People in their little apartments wake up to the sound of masses of other people calling out for help, of the thunderous footsteps of crowds tearing through the streets, and then of a strange gurgling sound that replaces the bedlam. A young woman throws open her blackout curtains to get a better look and finds herself melting along with them. Across town, a landlord knocks on his tenant's door, demanding some overdue rent, but there is no answer only the slop of something oozing across the floor inside. Security footage of Times Square catches an eerie sight, masses of molten flesh spreading across the streets. The masses of tourists that were gathered there only hours before melted together into something else, bathed in the neon glow of the billboards and lights of the city. Hour 3. On the other side of the world, in Canberra, Australia, a group of college students is camping in the wilderness. While the United States is waking up to a horror show, they are sleeping soundly in their tents beneath the light of the moon. Well, except for one of them, who had decided to take his sleeping bag outside and sleep under the stars. That would have been a lovely idea, except for the fact that all sunlight, including that which reflected off the moon, has become quite destructive to the human body. To all living things, in fact. His melted form sloshes around inside the sleeping bag, trying to regain some semblance of its original shape. Inside their tent, his friends are still themselves, shielded remarkably well from the light by the thick canvas. That is, until one of them gets up to go to the bathroom and unzips the front of the tent. His mouth is already useless by the time he thinks to scream, and the moonlight floods inside and covers the group in a silvery glow. It doesn't take long for them to meet the same fate as their friend outside, melting together into one massive entity. They had hoped this camping trip would bring them closer together, and, well, it did. Hour 4. Meanwhile, a speleologist is deep in the bowels of a cave in Tianxiang that she has been studying, completely unaware of the terrors of the surface. She's taking samples, dictating notes to her research assistant, and keeping an eye out for bats, when suddenly, she receives a communication from one of the members of her research team up above. The technology they use only allows for short text messages that can be transmitted through the layers of soil and rock all around, but this warning needs only a few words. Don't come up. Not safe. The words send a chill up her spine. What could possibly be happening that's more dangerous than being down here? She writes back, asking for clarification, but receives none. Through the dark tunnels illuminated only by a few headlamps, she thinks she can hear the echo of a scream. Hour 5. Those that are still safe and have managed to hold on to their identities and forms have noticed yet another threat in addition to whatever the light is doing. All around the world, planes are dropping from the sky, their pilots and crews transformed into something incapable of flying an aircraft. Airplanes that were en route to their various destinations, thousands of them going in every direction imaginable, are now plummeting towards the ground, crashing into the ocean, or in some especially unlucky cases, landing on buildings that still have survivors inside. It's a truly brutal bit of irony to escape the sun's terrible rays and find some small sanctuary only to have an airplane fall out of the sky and destroy it all. Hour 6. Over at the SCP Foundation, everyone is on high alert, trying to categorize what is happening and find a way to stop it. But how do you contain an anomaly when that anomaly is the sun itself? In the meantime, the O5 Council retreats to a specialized underground bunker constructed especially for this kind of dire scenario. Outfitted with beds, reading materials, and enough supplies to keep them alive for several years, as long as no one hogs the snacks. 
as the rest of the Foundation staff scramble to find a solution before the rest of the Earth's population is reduced to goo. The anomalies contained throughout the various sites begin to take notice. SCP-999 oozes frantically around its site, hugging and nuzzling anyone it can get close to. It doesn't fully understand what is going on, but it can tell that everyone is quite upset and frightened by something, and it wants to help them feel better. Other anomalies have a less charitable approach. SCP-173 takes advantage of the chaos to escape containment, snapping a few necks on its way out just for fun. After all, everyone's eyes are otherwise occupied. Because it is not made from any organic material, it is immune to the effects of the sun and makes its way outside to explore the pandemonium. Research staff passed by SCP-682's containment chamber can hear the giant beast chuckling to itself a sickening, choking sound as it laughs at the fall of humanity. Finally, it sighs. One scientist peeking through the observation window swears that the hard-to-destroy reptile is smiling before one of his colleagues ushers him down the hall, away from the monster's celebration. SCP-507 appears in the hall with a pop, back from another one of his involuntary interdimensional voyages. Whoa, where's the fire? He asks, taking in the hysteria around him. Uh, did, uh, something get out? A bit of unease creeps into his voice. No! Shouts a passing guard. It's what's trying to get in! God, I have the worst timing. 507 groans. Hour 7. Back in the realm of civilians, newscasters hop on to broadcast from studios devoid of natural light, unsure if there are any survivors left to hear their messages. One television personality forces his usual bright smile staring down the barrel of the camera with barely concealed tears in his eyes. He can't let his smile crack, can't let himself break down. If he lets himself cry, really cry, he's scared he won't be able to stop. Please, remain calm, he reads off the teleprompter, as a production assistant sobs into the shoulder of the camera operator. Experts are working to determine what is going on. In the meantime, Please follow these instructions to ensure your safety and that of your loved ones. Do not go outside unless you are covered in proper equipment to shield yourself from the sun or moon. Block all sources of natural light in your residence. Do not attempt to interact with those who have been affected by this disaster. Do not touch them. Do not let them into your home. Do not speak to them. Again, please remain calm. Help is on the way. He doesn't know if the words are true. He only knows that it's his responsibility to give the people hope, something familiar they can turn to when nothing makes sense. The camera switches off. He covers his face and lets the tears loose. Hour 8. In spite of the pleas from newscasters, people are very much panicking. How could they not? Everything's descended into absolute mayhem, and it's only been eight hours since it all began. Unfortunately, where there is panic, there's someone trying to make a quick buck off of their fellow man. Even more unfortunately, the internet is still up and running so far. And with survivors taking to social media to live tweet their experiences and post as much as they can on Instagram, Facebook, and anywhere else they can reach out for help, it is the perfect environment for scammers. A Twitter thread goes viral claiming that wrapping oneself in aluminum foil will protect against the effects of the light. Facebook posts circulate hawking all sorts of natural remedies and super sunscreens from essential oil blends to bacon grease. A fraudulent GoFundMe page pops up, claiming to belong to a climate scientist raising money for a ray gun that will reverse the damage done to the Earth's atmosphere, which he cites as the cause of the destruction. Hour 9. Not all the information circulating online is false, however. A video is posted on TikTok with the caption, These mofos can talk featuring video of a teenage boy cowering in a dark room as one of the formerly human flesh creatures moves around outside the door. After a moment or two of silence, a garbled voice calls out to him, Brian, come outside. Please come out into the sun. I miss you. The video's comments are filled with other users sharing similar experiences, saying, It talked just like my boyfriend. It barked like a dog, or even, it was singing my favorite Ariana Grande song. Similar videos pop up in the wake of this first recording, urging survivors to ignore the voices, no matter who they seem like they belong to. Hour 10. While some people are using the internet to spread helpful information on the nature of the events outside, 
Others have ruled out rational explanations entirely, claiming that this is divine punishment for the sins of mankind, or the Matrix finally collapsing in on itself. Others deny that the horrible events are even happening at all. An infamously contrarian livestream personality logs on from his insulated basement, crowing to his viewers that, None of this is actually happening. It's all a ploy to keep us complacent and under government control. Ask yourself, why don't they want us going outside so we don't see what they're really up to? As commenters try desperately to change his mind, he doubles down, You're all just a bunch of sheeple, Baba. He laughs. Look, I'll show you there's nothing to worry about. He carries his laptop upstairs with him and steps outside onto the sidewalk. In his computer screen, he can see the video feed of his own face beginning to droop and liquefy before he can even feel it. He tries to run back inside, away from the light, but it's too late. His legs are already giving out. The viewers can only watch as their favorite streamer dissolves in real time until his now useless hands drop the laptop to the ground, where it breaks into pieces and the stream goes dark. Hour 12. For those who have survived this long, at the 12 hour mark things are beginning to get tense. Actually, that would be an understatement. Tensions have been bubbling steadily for the past 12 hours, as people have melted into unrecognizable waxy monsters, exploded in plane crashes, and been traumatized to within an inch of their lives. Now those tensions are boiling over. Human beings in a crisis can be a bit like crabs in a bucket vicious and ready to tear each other to pieces if they perceive that they might be left behind. When there is a shortage of resources, this selfish fear and anger only gets worse. Hour 13. There might not be a lack of food or fresh water yet, but there is another resource that seems worth destroying each other for. Darkness. In a world where light means death, the only safe place is in the dark. But there are a limited number of places that people can go. In rural areas, families retreat to storm cellars or the insides of empty grain silos. In cities, underground parking garages become hiding places, and there just isn't enough space there to go around. People erupt into physical fights in these parking complexes, punching and shoving each other, even attacking with broken bottles and other improvised weapons, all to stake their claim over this newfound territory. Even more contentious are warehouses, insulated hiding places filled with all the supplies that will soon start to dwindle. Toilet paper, canned goods, soap, and bottled water. These things just might be worth killing for, and many are already prepared to do so. Hour 14. While the SCP Foundation is busy trying to maintain order and find a way to end this catastrophic event, other groups dedicated to the anomalous are equally busy. The Chaos Insurgency attempt to launch a sneak attack on Site-19 while its occupants are distracted. However, their defenses against the sun prove ineffective, and they are melted before they can so much as reach the site's entrance. Inside, the Foundation staff never even notice. They have far too much on their hands already. Other groups take a less offensive approach, prioritizing safety. Members of the Serpent's Hand escape to the Interdimensional Wanderer's Library along with their families, settling in for the long haul and preparing to make it their permanent home as the Earth burns. They didn't want it to end this way, but they are not going to stick around to be a part of it all. Hour 18. Not all people are turning on each other, even as things appear dire. The best thing anyone can do in a horrible situation is to look for those willing to extend a helping hand. There will always be people trying to look out for others, to put out the fires, and airlift people out of the floodwaters. Though this disaster seems anything but natural, the instinct to help is still there for many. Doctors and nurses hole up in hospitals, blocking out the windows with spare pairs of scrubs and whatever else they can find to light-proof the building. There they treat the wounded that make it inside, wrapping broken bones and stitching up wounds as best they can. A few well-intentioned souls even attempt to treat those changed by the sun, those things that barely look human anymore, no matter how hard they try to arrange their soft bodies back into their former shape. It is too late for them, though. There's nothing to be done, and no medical school in the world could have prepared a doctor to heal this hurt. But what about the people who aren't all the way gone? The ones who started to change but got inside in time to slow or even stop the process? Hospital staff treat the melting like an infection, amputating molten limbs or attempting to clean and bandage them, 
unsure of what to do with a piece of human body that no longer behaves like flesh and bone. They're able to save a few people, but far more are already doomed by the time they make it inside. They disintegrate slowly, but steadily, fading away on the operating table until their warbling voices are urging the doctors to follow them outside. It doesn't hurt, they promise, reaching out with fleshy tentacles that were one's hands. It's hard to remember the Hippocratic Oath when a monster is trying to pull you into its grasp. Hour 20 While some are trying to help the creatures created by the sun's wrath, others have been waiting for this moment since they saw their very first zombie movie. To them, this is an outbreak, plain and simple, and it's the perfect chance to suit up and play soldier. They cloak themselves in body armor and helmets with dark tinted visors and grab whatever weapons they can find. Grenades, firearms, flamethrowers, anything is fair game at the end of the world. A former police officer and massive fan of zombie-themed first-person shooters takes to the streets, staring down an enormous mound of flesh made from dozens of people melting together, ropey tentacles flailing and grasping for more bodies to add to its mass. He fires an array of bullets into the thing but they are absorbed into its surface, swallowed up inside. He searches for weak points, for eyes, a heart, anything he can target, but he can't spot anything vulnerable. But he's not deterred. He'll try fire next. He lights a homemade Molotov cocktail and hurls it at the beast, waiting for it to ignite and listening for the sound of its painful cries. But nothing comes. The cocktail explodes and nearby debris catches on fire, but the ball of flesh doesn't react. It just continues to advance towards him, making its way down the street as if it has all the time in the world. There's only one option left, and it's the riskiest one of all. He pulls out a grenade and pulls the pin. Throwing it won't do. He needs to run up and thrust the grenade into the body of the monster to blow it up from the inside. He's going to have to be quick. He summons all the stamina from his high school track and field days and makes a mad sprint for the creature, holding the grenade out in front of him. Eyes on the prize, there is nothing but the mission now, the chance to be a hero. He is so singularly focused on his task that he doesn't notice a tentacle snaking along the ground toward him until it loops around his feet, flipping him over until he's upside down. The force of the movement knocks his helmet loose and it falls to the ground. He moves to shield his face with his hands, but it's useless. The sunlight has already found him. He is already changing, becoming one with the very thing he promised to destroy. He stares up at the mass with reverence, just before his eyes drop out of his head and reaches his arms out to welcome the embrace. By the time the grenade detonates, he can't bring himself to care about it. He can't care about anything except being part of the flesh. Hour 22 If individuals have a tendency to blame each other in times of strife, then governments are even worse. Surviving leaders of various countries, shivering in their bunkers and tearing out their hair with stress, begin to convince themselves that this must be some kind of act of biological warfare gone wrong. Nuclear testing, some kind of deadly gas, something. Surely ruination on this grand of a scale must be man-made. With no other recourse, they begin declaring war on each other. Everyone pointing a finger at someone else as no one is able to take responsibility. The threats, the denials, and the rage escalate until finally, the North Korean government makes a decision that would seem completely insane under any other circumstances. They attempt to nuke the sun. It's irrational and it's ineffective, of course, but it's the last gasp of a species hurtling towards extinction. One final attempt to bring it all to an end before it's all truly over. Hour 24 And as the dusk clears, it becomes completely apparent the old world is dead and a new world, for better or for much, much worse, is born. Nothing will ever be the same again. For decades upon decades, conspiracy theories have long captured the minds of many individuals and groups across the world. The infamous ones will always spring to mind the moment somebody so much as speaks the phrase conspiracy theory aloud. The words alone conjure up questions like, were the moon landings really faked? Did aliens really have a hand in building the pyramids? And is there really a shadowy ancient order called the Illuminati controlling the events of the world around us? Of course, the answer to all of these questions is often a plain and resounding no, now please leave me alone. 
But delving into the world of conspiracy theories, collecting and connecting evidence can be an interesting exercise in imagination when it's all done in good fun. But there is often a dangerous side to conspiracy theories as well. And we don't mean getting so close to the truth that the men in black show up to your front door and haul you away to Area 51. No, it's important to remember the harm that some conspiracy theories can do. It's an unfortunate truth that a number of conspiracy theories, especially those more prevalent in recent years, are often used to unjustly villainize particular religious or ethnic minorities. Boasting about ancient aliens can be fun when you remember that conspiracy theories have no actual bearing on the real world. But the line has to be drawn somewhere. The minute a theory starts to delve into unseemly territory, it's best to realize that there's very little truth to it. There is one infamous conspiracy theory, not a vindictive or harmful one, that has stood the test of time for almost as long as the moon landings or Area 51. Who really killed President John F. Kennedy? We all know or think we know what really happened on November 22, 1963, on that fateful day in Dallas, Texas. But what if that's the point? We all think we know, but each of us thinks differently. Grab your red string and shiniest tinfoil hats and take a seat, folks. Welcome to SCP-001, otherwise known by the appropriate nickname, The Conspiracy. Now, first things first, some important information. Anyone familiar with the SCP Foundation will tell you that there are multiple entities and objects referred to as SCP-001. Everyone has some idea which of these they think is the real one. But just in case you happen to be new here, we'll clarify for you. The designation SCP-001 doesn't refer to a single creature, object, or entity within the Foundation's archive. Instead, it's a collection of various anomalies that have been encountered and mostly contained by the SCP Foundation. As for why these various files are all collected under this shared designation, well, that's a conspiracy theory all in itself. It could be that these anomalies are some of the earliest ever contained by the Foundation, and were first encountered before they had established the numbering system that they currently use. However, could these multiple SCP-001s be an intentional misdirection? Smells like another conspiracy to us. Among the anomalies sharing the title of SCP-001 is the Gate Guardian, a powerful being believed to be an angel standing at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Then there's the infamous Scarlet King, another anomalous eldritch creature with similar levels of destructive power, who is intent on one day causing the destruction of all creation. Also known as SCP-001 is a database containing all of the proof the Foundation's top brass has collected that prove their entire universe is the fictional creation of the SCP wiki authors. Pretty wild stuff. And then there's this SCP-001, the conspiracy itself. As we mentioned before, it's connected to the assassination of United States President John F. Kennedy. Very closely connected, at least for a few seconds before it came out on the other side. That is because in this instance, SCP-001 is the bullet that killed JFK. Now history tells us that on Friday, November 22, 1969, the 35th President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was riding in an open-top car as part of a presidential motorcade traveling through Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. A former U.S. Marine named Lee Harvey Oswald opened fire on the President through the window of a nearby building, tragically killing JFK. But ever since Kennedy's death, there have been rampart speculation about what really happened in Dallas. Most theories suggest that there was a secret organization involved or multiple shooters in addition to Lee Harvey Oswald. According to the Foundation, through some anomalous means, the shot that killed John F. Kennedy was fired by multiple unidentified assailants, acting as a part of the same or numerous conspiracies, all shooting at the exact same moment. The events surrounding the bullet's trajectory are designated under the codename Incident 001 Gamma. Anyone alive that has memories linked to Incident 001 Gamma is part of the last population on planet Earth that can agree on a shared concept of truth. They know what is true thanks to all sharing an experience of either hearing about the Kennedy assassination or witnessing it in person or on television. When SCP-001 was fired, it created Incident 001 Gamma which was both a pivotal moment in history and also had a lasting effect on everything that followed. It might not be obvious how just yet, 
but we'll get to the repercussions in a moment. The fact that multiple generations alive at the time of Incident 001 Gamma have a consistent memory of it establishes a baseline. Essentially because these people have vivid memories of the assassination, they also have a societal memory of everything that had occurred in human history up until that day in 1969. The evolution of mankind, the various wars that had occurred had all been documented and were held to be true. There was a shared, collective truth among Earth's entire population, up until Incident 001 Gamma occurred. However, reality had shattered in some way, the moment that SCP-001 was shot towards JFK. The sheer number of conspiracy theories that tumbled out of the Kennedy assassination weren't just rampart speculation. Not only did everyone on Earth now have a memory of what happened, they had their own version of what they believed they had remembered. For example, from the moment that Incident 001 Gamma took place and JFK was shot, there were already conflicting witness testimonies from people who were actually present in Dallas and saw it all happen. A significant percentage of eyewitnesses reported some variation of seeing a strange, unidentified figure referred to only as Badge Man. Whoever he was, even if he was just a result of civilians being unfamiliar with seeing Secret Service agents, not everyone that was present at Incident 001 Gamma can agree if Badge Man was even there at all. The only two people that were definitely participants in the assassination were President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald. History diverged for everyone from that point on, remembering everything that came before, but having conflicting memories of Incident 001 Gamma and everything that followed it. What the SCP Foundation knows for a fact is that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots from his vantage point on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. The first missed. The second delivered a wound to the president as well as Texas Governor John Connolly, who was riding in the same car as JFK. The third and final shot was SCP-001, which vaporized the cranial cavity, killing him and causing Incident 001 Gamma. From that moment on, there now existed a confusing and contradictory number of different perspectives on the world's history, all conflicting with one another. People's perceptions began to divert away from reality over the course of the next decade, slowly and unnoticeably at first. Everyone could still agree on what had happened since Incident 001 Gamma for the most part, until September 5, 1975, the failed assassination of Gerald Ford, the 38th President of the United States. Multiple witnesses reported seeing different versions of the event, some even certain that President Ford was, in fact, killed. This even resulted in another attempt on Ford's life only two weeks later, by a woman who believed the president was already dead attempting to make reality align with what she thought to be real. But it gets worse. President Ford had equally been affected by SCP-001, believing that the Soviet Union had withdrawn from Eastern Europe during the Nixon administration. In reality, this didn't occur until the late 1980s. That is the true effect of SCP-001. The disparity between what someone perceives to be real and what is actually real. It can often manifest in frustration. We've all once felt that we have the skills required when applying for a job, only to have a rejection email sent back to us. Some of us believe ourselves to be kind, good-hearted people, yet can't seem to find any friend that would agree. Living in a huge house can make a person feel cramped and claustrophobic despite all the space around them. You can feel that there is something wrong in situations like this, but you can't explain it. This effect of SCP-001 can often result in conditions like imposter syndrome, where someone has the belief that all of their achievements and successes are nothing more than a sham, and that the best parts of their lives are destined to fall apart because that person does not deserve them. That feeling of not belonging, the world not aligning with what you think is true, all comes from SCP-001. The phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect is also seemingly derived from the fractalization that occurred after Incident 001 Gamma. The Mandela Effect usually refers to a memory held by an individual or group of individuals that they believe to be true, but actually differs from fact. For example, the effect is named after Nelson Mandela, who died in 2013. However, countless people distinctly remember news that Mandela had died in prison during the 80s. Misremembering history comes as a result of a person's perception and their living memory being out of sync with that which is true. 
Often trying to undo the effects of SCP-001 can be more harmful to a person as having their perception vary so dramatically from reality. Say you believe that all of the Beatles were still alive. You were positive of it, and it had always been that way all of your life. Then somebody presented you with actual historical proof that John Lennon was killed outside his hotel in the year 1980. All the photographs, news reports, and other evidence in the world couldn't convince you that what you thought to be true, in fact, wasn't. Frequently, this leads to frustration and confusion that could, and often does, damage relationships with friends and family, causing isolation and disconnection of social associations. If everyone is telling you that John Lennon died, but you can't believe it because it doesn't match your own perception, you would gravitate towards people whose alternate viewpoints overlapped with yours. This is how echo chambers form, which spread and strengthen conspiracy theories, often making them more resilient against outside logic, as well as more extreme and pernicious. So who really did kill President John F. Kennedy? Ask Lee Harvey Oswald. He'd say he didn't do it and was instead being framed. Ask Fidel Castro and he'd tell you that he and his men were there in Dallas that day, armed and on a mission to kill Kennedy themselves. Or there's the Umbrella Man, who claimed he killed JFK with a modified umbrella. But ultimately speculating as to who killed President Kennedy is pointless. Every answer is right to someone. SCP-001 was the shot that changed the entire world. Since Incident 001-Gamma, nobody has been able to perceive the world in the exact same way as someone else does. If you feel confused, rely on what you know to be real, what you believe is the truth, and find comfort in the normalcy of that. Honestly, it's all you really have. The SCP Foundation depends on staying out of the public eye and away from public perception in order to accomplish their vital work. If the public were to find out about the Foundation and the nightmares it spends every day protecting us from, it would be total chaos worldwide. They would be so busy trying to field attention from civilians, politicians, and reporters, fending off every random Joe with a smartphone who wanted to take an Instagram story of SCP-096 and endanger his life, that they wouldn't have time to contain all the world-ending anomalies out there. So, they operate entirely under the radar. But it wasn't always this way. There was a time when the world at large knew about the SCP Foundation, and the researchers had to find out a way to step out of the spotlight for good. Like everything else about the SCP Foundation, it wasn't easy. The road to the Foundation's current cloak of secrecy was paved with trial and error, experimental magic, and a formidable woman known by the alias Elizabeth Crocker. This is the story of SCP-001, the frontispiece, also known as the Pikmin Blank Proposal. It all started in 1964, when several national governments discovered that the Foundation's Overwatch Command was working both for and against all of the countries involved in the Cold War. Canada, the USSR, Israel and Lebanon, and Egypt all withdrew support for the Foundation. The most catastrophic was the withdrawal of support from the United States government, ordered by Lyndon B. Johnson, after his national security team discovered the Foundation had been involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. At the same time as the Foundation's relationship with these global powers was crumbling, the Foundation made one of its most powerful enemies ever. Person of Interest, 001. Also known by her alias Elizabeth Crocker, was a member of the CIA beginning in 1959. There, she fell in love with a fellow agent named Dr. Alexandre Hilbert, who was working on a quantum brace capable of altering probability. In 1964, the Foundation reached out to Dr. Hilbert in an attempt to recruit him, but he refused. Shortly after this, he was killed during a test of the quantum brace. Crocker attributed his death to the Foundation, believing them to have tampered with his machine in order to punish him for turning down their offer. After the death of her love, Crocker swore to destroy the SCP Foundation for good. On October 19, 1967, Crocker disguised herself as the personal driver of a member of the O5 Council and shot her one dozen times before dropping her body outside of a Foundation safe house in San Francisco. A note was found on the body with a message from Elizabeth Crocker. It ended with this promise. It's high time somebody broke up your tidy little racket. No, more than one somebody, everybody. We're going to contain you. 
and you're going to suffocate. Agent Crocker endangered the Foundation's security, seeming to possess a knowledge of all of its outposts, as well as the ability to decipher even its most secure communication ciphers. Several members of personnel holed up in Havana, Cuba during January of 1968 began to brainstorm, looking for a way to increase security and keep the Foundation together in the face of these new threats. A number of different researchers were in attendance, including Dr. Eric Euler a thaumatologist or a scientist in the field of ritual magic. Though some of his colleagues failed to treat him with the respect he deserved, some out of skepticism and some out of outright bigotry towards his Jewish identity, Euler was a brilliant mind with an idea that could save them all. Dr. Euler proposed a potent solution to the chaos spreading across the world. As companies owned by the Foundation were being exposed and destroyed and their facilities reduced to rubble, Dr. Euler suggested that it might be possible to place some sort of illusion over the businesses acting as fronts for the Foundation, preventing them from being found out by any outsiders. Caddy O'Donnell responded that that wouldn't be enough, that they needed to find a way to get the world to forget the Foundation existed at all, at least for a little while. Dr. Euler, at a loss, reached out to Site-43 to see if they had any thaumatologists at their facility. There was one, in fact. Dr. Okori. Dr. Edwin Falkirk and Chief of Security and Containment Martin Strauss were sent in to brief him on the situation at hand. During their conversation, Okori reported thaumaturgic changes made around his place of work. The information he shared caught Strauss's attention immediately. After a moment of thought, Strauss knew exactly what it meant and who was behind it. It was a sign from someone who would prove immensely helpful, and a mysterious man named Philo Zwist. Thilo Zwist, also known as Person of Interest 382, as well as a long list of aliases, is a highly skilled cryptomancer who has used his control of anomalies to render himself functionally immortal. He performs a form of magic using language and was previously associated with an organization known as the Giftschreiber, or the Poison Riders. Since his discovery, Zwist has spent decades involved in a cat and mouse game of sorts with Site 43 director Dr. V. L. Scout. Now, the same Dr. Scout had planted a reference to Zwist in the mind of Dr. Okori to suggest that the Foundation contact the elusive man for help. With this new plan in motion, Dr. Okori attempted to make contact with Zwist in March of 1968. He met the man at an abandoned building in the Harbour Front District of Toronto. There he found Zwist, who claimed to be expecting him. He teased Okore about the unwanted attention the Foundation was receiving, as well as the danger posed by Elizabeth Crocker. Eventually, he asked, Are you here to ask for my help, or did I let you find me for no good reason? Okore admitted that he was seeking help, and Zwist explained his special method of combining writing with ritual magic in order to imbue the words with power or danger. He offered to craft a phrase, a series of words that, when written on a sign created by him, would keep the public from seeing who the Foundation truly was. He offered to do it exactly once, but not recreate it going forward. All he needed was a piece of language to craft his spell. Dr. Okore offered an initialism as a possibility, suggesting the SCP that comes before the Foundation. Zwist laughed delightfully at this and said simply, Oh, this is going to work out splendidly. One week later, Zwist brought Dr. Okore a simple logo design for a non-existent business called Scout's Cargo Packing, as well as a chemical formula for an antidote that would inoculate anyone who received it against the sign's magical properties. After approval by the O5 Council, the logo was printed on a fleet of moving trucks that could then be used to transport personnel and items across North America without any detection. It was highly effective, and the Foundation began plans to spread this new protective measure throughout all of its facilities. In May of 1968, a collision along Route 66 in the United States damaged one of the trucks, removing its magical functionality. Curious about the repercussions of Zwist's work being destroyed, and about any potentially dangerous effects, Dr. Euler formed the Mimesis and Cryptomancy Research Group, where he worked alongside Dr. Okore and Dr. Ilse Renders. As Dr. Renders suffered from a condition that rendered her unable to leave a sealed chamber in Site-43, Euler was reassigned to that facility, 
and worked alongside her and Okori there. During their research, the team learned that damage to Zwist's writing changed its properties in a variety of ways, and he continued breaking down the trucks to try and understand them. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Crocker had not let up in her dogged pursuit of the Foundation's destruction. A shipping container bearing the insignia of a defunct Foundation front company was discovered in the Port of Los Angeles on July 2, 1968, containing the badly beaten but still alive Abrasha Skokolsky. A note was pinned to his tie reading, Can you feel the noose yet? Back at Site-43, Euler, Renders, and Okore reached a breakthrough. The power of Zwist's work came not from the full words of Scout's cargo packing, but from the initials SCP itself. Using a combination of grammar and magic, much to the excitement of every English teacher and fantasy fan, they could transfer the properties of Zwist's sign to any other sign bearing the same initials. Just like it always has at the Foundation, it all came down to SCP. A variety of former front businesses were revived, all bearing the same initials. There was Star City Poker, Supply Control and Purification, and, of course, Sawyer's Cheesy Pretzels. The high from this breakthrough quickly gave way to another devastating loss, however, as Agent Crocker struck again. In Johannesburg, South Africa, Agent Crocker infiltrated an SCP site under the alias Dr. Gabrielle Fish. There she exacerbated existing racial tensions and took advantage of the apartheid state to sow discord. Crocker killed Regional Director Jansen and dumped his body near Site-19. With a note in this jacket pocket, it said, you're running out of continents. As the research team kicked off their efforts into high gear, preparing an official research proposal on quantum lingua physics, Elizabeth Crocker continued her grim work. In the People's Republic of China, she used cryptomancy to trigger severe paranoia in Chairman Mao Zedong, drawing his attention to Foundation representatives hiding in the People's Republic of China. This forced Dr. Noble to escape the country, leaving behind any Foundation influence in China. There was, yet again, a note left for her. Five minutes to midnight. Crocker was closing in. Next, Crocker aligned herself with U.S. President Richard Nixon, tipping him off to the existence of the Foundation and convincing him to have the U.S. Army occupy the facility. Euler, Okore, and Renders had to act, and act fast. Each of the doctors tentatively signed off on the project, ready to put the experiment into practice. Meanwhile, Crocker got bolder and more violent. She killed Foundation personnel whenever she got the chance, abandoning long-form political strategy in favor of spectacle. She used an auditory cryptomantic agent embedded in a recording of I Wanna Hold Your Hand by the Beatles to kill 10 Foundation personnel in a safe house in Scotland. Next, she infiltrated Site-43, where she was defeated by intervention from Zwist himself. At Site-01, on July 9, 1969, Dr. Euler and Dr. Okore now put their creation into place, called the Frontispiece. Within two weeks, its effects had spread across the world, cloaking every Foundation front in its anomalous effects. By June of 1970, the Foundation could come out of frightened, panicked hiding and resume regular hiding. They were working actively in the world again, building new sites all the time. In August of 1971, one of the Foundation's trucks was unable to cross beyond the Berlin Wall, as the guards stationed there only read the Cyrillic alphabet. Dr. Euler proposed a solution in the form of a New York-based artist whose work posed similar properties to Zwist's writing. This artist was a man named Andy Warhol, and the Foundation commissioned him to create an imagery-based version of the frontispiece, compatible with all known languages, allowing the effects to extend to regions that use different alphabets. In the later 1970s, Crocker resurfaced and escaped custody, and shortly after, Dr. Okore was found murdered in his home. She remained active through the 80s, aligning herself with the Reagan administration in an ineffective attempt to make him launch an attack on the Foundation. Currently, it is believed that she is dead, as she would now be over 100 years old. However, if Zwist is any indication, there are tools out there that might have allowed her to extend her life far beyond what is natural. To this day, the work of the original research team lives on, even as the scientists behind it have passed away. It is highly effective, with one exception. Repeated exposure to anomalous activity renders someone immune to the effects of the frontispiece. Otherwise, however, the Foundation remains secured, contained, and protected. 
A final letter from Thilo Zwist was recovered among Dr. Euler's effects after his death in 2013, reminding them of their duty to protect the world and do the right thing. He ended the letter with this. Your course was set the moment I baked that lovely little flaw into the writing which you stole. I robbed you of the opportunity to become the tyrants of all our nightmares. You will have no choice but to be better than that, because evil only flourishes in ease. You will never know ease. You and those who come after you will need to keep doing the work. You will get to decide how well you do it, of course. And on that matter, I have a suggestion. Do it right. Stop compromising principles. What the heck is consensus reality? And is it really the answer to everything? You may have seen us mention the subject before. Consensus reality, after all, is what the SCP Foundation is trying to preserve in the face of ever-increasing anomalous activity. A kind of truth, or normalcy, that all of us can agree on. Pick 10 people at random and ask them, what color is the sky? What gaseous element is produced by trees? Has every US president since Washington secretly been an alien reptile in disguise? The answer will, or at least should, be blue, oxygen, and no. This is consensus reality. But no, not really. Yes, in a more casual sense, the state of reality to which we all agree could be a viable definition of the term consensus reality. But you likely don't remember being called upon for a vote along with the rest of humanity on what is and isn't quote-unquote normal. That's because consensus reality isn't the consensus of everyone. It's the consensus of the most powerful beings alive, the O5 Council. In this instance, SCP-001 is the ever-updating document that records exactly what normal is. But perhaps even more important is that anything that exists outside the Council's most recent definition of normal is targeted for containment. While at face value it seems less flashy than something like the Gate Guardian or the terrifying Scarlet King, or the insane twists and turns of the Ouroboros cycle, the document defining consensus reality, despite being the only thing on the database to be given the classification non-anomalous, is about as <clears throat> foundational as foundation documents get. Literally everything currently in containment is there because this document deems it so. It is the SCP Foundation's Ten Commandments of Containment, and thou shalt contain. If this document was ever leaked, it could lead to a complete broken masquerade scenario, where the anomalous cat is let fully out of the bag. Only the O5 Council has access to the document, and it's only through consensus that additions, alterations, or removals can be made. Naturally, it's a document that's in extremely high demand among the anomalous community, because it answers the big question that every anomalous individual has. If I'm not even dangerous, if I've committed no crime that would necessitate the locking up of a non-anomalous human, why am I still being contained? And don't worry, today we're going to answer that question. Or rather, the O5 Council will. But let's return to the Council themselves. We've covered them and their many interpretations before. From them being a group of fantastical, immortal demigods, to being a frightening hive mind, to being a shadowy faction of mysterious, emotionless bureaucrats, constantly conniving and undermining each other to gain just that little bit more power. But what's more frightening? The keys to normality being in the hands of these larger-than-life fantastical figures, or in the hands of human beings, just as valuable and afraid as the rest of us, with only the knowledge of the strange things going on behind the curtain to protect them from the truly unknowable. The O5 Council holds meetings with some regularity where they ask themselves and each other whether any new developments in the wider world require changes to the new normal. It is up to the O5 Council to define the difference between universal laws, gravitation, physical forces, and basic chemistry, biology, sociology, psychology, technology, and philosophy, and the kind of crackpot theories being spouted by people on street corners carrying the end is nigh signs. Some of their decisions are quite simple. Can a new development be explained by the laws of an existing non-anomalous framework? If so, the rules need not be changed. The current paradigm of our understanding can rest neatly in place, but other decisions fall into a gray area. In order to illustrate this, we're going to do something unprecedented. 
We're going to go into the actual boardroom of the O5 Council and see exactly what decisions they made about our consensus reality, the one that you and I are living in right now. We're going to look at three different meetings, one from 1932, another from 1945, and an example from as recently as 2014. So what really goes on in the discussions that define what we all would consider normal? The 1932 discussion was spurred on by strange development happening in the United Kingdom. New forms of occult-adjacent witchcraft and spiritualism were beginning to take off, descended largely from traditional pagan and Wicca beliefs. The fact that some of these believers were actually attempting spells was enough to catch the Foundation's all-seeing eye, and the matter was discussed by the O5 Council. O5-3 said, Why are we even covering this? There are traditional beliefs in culture throughout history that we do not consider anomalous. We must not use our position to threaten the right of humanity to believe. With a stern look, O5-7 replied, Except this does not extend from traditional practices. This new witchcraft is a modern invention, developed through a scholarly rereading of practices as an alternative to Christianity. It is not a continuation and practitioners are attempting spell casting. O5-5 chimed in with, Now ah, soon you'll say Alistair Crowley has something to do with it. The document is clear. Theurgy is anomalous. Religion and spirituality are not. Show me proof that they are casting spells that cannot be explained under rigorous testing and I will personally see to containing those spells myself. Until then, no. Just as the lemma is allowed, so shall this witchcraft. For God's sake, we'll allow Satanism as long as they aren't channeling demonic energies. O5-1, the most senior member of the council, nodded and said, Agreed. Furthermore, we will need all the faith we can muster against the Thurgic traditions. We never know when a new faith will assist in our cause. No updates to consensus reality were made. In 1945, an event of far greater magnitude took place. The use of terrifying new weapons by the U.S. military in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that resulted in the deaths of over 200,000 people. The Council converged to discuss the earth-shattering event and what their reaction to it should be. Shaking, O5-2 said, Thank you for responding to my emergency call. Trinity has happened. I can barely contain what I saw. It was like the sun rising from the desert sand, a dawn of destruction and fire that lasted for miles around. I cannot believe that such an explosion could ever be seen as possible. Tales and prior evidence of the summoning of gods have had less impact. I tremble with fear about the possibility of people wielding this kind of power, the ability to level a city with the flick of a switch. O5-4 replied, Weren't the Germans and Russians also developing this technology? We are at war, and this sort of escalation happens. O5-5 said, May I remind my esteemed colleagues that we are not at war? The United States, Japan, they are at war. We are not nations. No, the question stands, is this anomalous? Do the physical effects follow from the mathematical concepts? O5-7 said, Hmm, they do follow. Your scientific testing was completed each and every step of the way to reach this point. I do not believe this is anomalous, no matter how frightening the repercussions are. O5-2, still understandably worked up, said, What, you're just going to let people hold on to the keys to their own destruction? We have fought tooth and nail to keep such capabilities out of the reach of man, and now you're saying we should abandon our purpose? O5-5 said, We do not prevent destruction. We sequester the anomalous. And as long as we agree that the test was arrived through diligent scientific process available to anyone... But O5-2 simply wasn't having it. He shot back, Available to anyone? Listen to yourself, man! Can you imagine a future where any two-bit dictator chooses to unleash the fire of a thousand suns wherever he wishes? Maybe the problem isn't with the equations. Maybe the whole of nuclear physics is anomalous itself. O5-1 once again brought his own level-headed perspective to the table. Enrico Fermi has already received a Nobel Prize for his work on transuranic elements and radioactivity. We can't just secure nuclear physics from the world. Radioactivity is everywhere, and we end up causing more contradictions when we try to send ourselves back to the Dark Ages. Try explaining chemistry without referring to covalent bonds. Try explaining biology. Nuclear physics is here to stay, and we had better get used to the consequences of this, no matter how terrifying this will be for the planet and for humanity. With a rattling sigh, O5-2 once again took a seat, murmuring, May God have mercy on our souls. In the aftermath of this debate, the document on consensus reality was altered to reflect these new developments in nuclear physics. 
as frightening as they were. I think we can all form a consensus on the fact that one-off murder is a less depressing subject than mass murder, and it was a single murder that led to the O5 Council discussing the concept of worms that walk in 2014. O5-6 came to the table with, For those unfamiliar with the topic, the worm that walks is a trope in which a character is actually a writhing hive mind of worms generally held together as a single mass. We're not here to discuss this trope, instead we are here to discuss the recent conspiracy that has arisen from it. The conspiracy is the idea that certain individuals are actually worms that walk, and not humans. When asked if this conspiracy had any merit to it, O5-6 replied, No, individual conspiracy believers are divided themselves on who is a worm that walks and who isn't. And all evidence indicates that there aren't actual worms that walk in the general populace. It pretty clearly falls under irreproducible conspiracy theories. I personally believe there's nothing we need to do or change in SCP-001. Another member of the council wasn't so sure that these results were irreproducible, saying, On December 11th, 2013, a believer in the conspiracy from Decatur, Alabama killed his neighbor under the belief that the neighbor was a worm that walks. The killer then took a video of his deceased neighbor and uploaded it to YouTube claiming it was proof of the conspiracy and that the corpse was dissolving into individual worms before his very eyes. He said that he was going to take a sample. The video was quickly blocked and removed and everyone who has viewed the video agrees that the subject is unmoving and does not dissolve into worms. The killer turned himself into police while clutching a jar of Tubifex worms and the neighbor sent to the Morgan County morgue. Autopsy confirmed that the decedent was missing a thumb post-mortem and killed by a gunshot to the chest, which if he were a worm that walks, would be survivable. When questioned whether these were just the actions of a single insane man, the council member continued, The one item of interest was that after the autopsy, the assistant coroner oversaw the return of the body to the next of kin. The assistant coroner was also a conspiracy believer, and despite not having any prior contact to the parties involved, screamed in disgust upon entering the examination room, grabbing a mop and complaining about all the worms everywhere. No one else noticed any signs of worm infestation. It was further discussed that D-classes who were shown the body didn't see it as anything other than a corpse. However, after being told about the worm that walks trope, several of them saw it as a writhing mass of worms. Some believe that this could be a mimetic side effect of actually encountering a living worm that walks. And updates were made to the document to reference the possible existence of perceptual monastic worm triggers. So now you know what the O5 Council is up to when not playing office golf or plotting each other's downfalls. They're having discussions about witchcraft, war crimes, and walking worms. You're probably feeling a pang of curiosity about the actual SCP-001 document especially if you're an understandably vindictive, anomalous individual wondering why the Foundation is carting you off to paranormal Gitmo for the simple crime of existing. And if you look for the true document, and you manage to survive the mimetic kill agents put in place to stop you, then what you'll actually find is even stranger. A letter to you from 05-5 explaining exactly what's happening to you. The letter reads, Hello, I'm afraid you won't find SCP-001 here. It's stored in a far more unreachable location than this. I'm sure you were hoping you could get in, edit it in a couple of places here and there, and voila, you're no longer anomalous, you're free to go. The Foundation will harass you no longer. Of course, it can't be that easy. But I'm going to help you. You deserve this much. I'm going to tell you why. Why the Foundation targets you. Why we deem you something to contain, to persecute. After all, there are far worse evils in the world we keep our record of nuclear weapons above as an example. There are numerous genocides throughout history. The death toll from just the flu alone is far greater than the potential damage for thousands of the people and objects we contain. And yet we dedicate ourselves to branding you anomalous. Something not normal. Something inherently wrong. Something that cannot be allowed its peace. Why? I'm not going to patronize you and say there's nothing I can do. I'm only one voice on the council, and I can't change things on my own, that's true. But the decisions I make, and the way I let myself view your circumstance, are a direct cause of people seeing fit to throw you into a box. Even if I can't change the document, I could remain one more advocate for your normalcy. After all, humanity has believed in ghosts and spirits for thousands of years. We all believe in the monster under our beds when we were children. 
These phenomena are very real, and very much a part of the way the world works. Why can't we just declare them normal? Why won't I free you from your torment? It's because we aren't only here to secure, contain, and protect the world. We're here to secure, contain, and protect you. The defining feature of the anomalous is that it cannot be explained through simple scientific testing. This makes you and your nature different, unique even. And that scarcity makes it valuable. But that doesn't mean that your value is something everyone can appreciate. Sometimes it can only be appreciated by those who would use it against you. The scarcity is also the tool by which a monster can exploit you. Others aren't familiar with your anomaly and won't respond to descriptions about it as real. This gives opportunity to nefarious individuals to exploit the lack of knowledge and use you as an eldritch pawn to their pleasure. They can isolate you, consume you, make your anomaly their lever to destroy, slake a sadistic thirst with your existence. I'm sure you've seen it happen. Someone is different. Their desires, needs, their reality forces them to be ostracized by the world at large. They're left alone, probably not friendless, but sidelined, starved for connection. That's when someone swoops in, promising greatness, but only offering that connection you crave through consumption of you, destruction of your world, perversion of your reality. You fight back, try to tell someone of your plight, but others respond, oh, that can't be happening, that's not real, you must be mistaken. You are alone in your anomaly and left to suffer. We can't let that happen. Yes, go ahead, point out that we're isolating you at least as well, slowly consuming you and your existence just as surely as some abuser might wish to burn you up. Call us monsters, it's okay. But keep in mind that even in our pursuit of you, our cover-up, our incarceration of you, we still want to make sure that you continue to exist, that you aren't removed entirely from this world. You have every right to exist. You have every right to be as different as you are. You, the monsters out there, the monsters in here, you are all just as real as we are. Just as real as the teeming, irrational, self-destructive humanity that remains ignorant to your plight. And the conclusion that we are all, in the end, the same stuff, I hope you can find comfort in it. Yes, you are a monster. But whether we are deemed anomalous or not, so is every last one of us. And that means you deserve your existence. We secure you. We contain you. We protect you. And even if you still don't get why I'm doing this, please understand that I still love you. The woman fell to the ground, clutching her ankle in pain. It had crunched badly as she'd fallen, and now as she looked down at it, she could see that it was bent totally out of shape. The heavy metal collar choking her neck made it difficult for her to catch her breath as she tried her best not to hyperventilate. The rain was hammering down so ferociously that she could barely see more than 20 feet in any direction, but she didn't need to see far to know how deadly of a predicament she had found herself in. She cried out at the top of her voice for someone to come and find her, anyone, but the only sound that filled her ears was the wild howling of the wind and the steady hammering of water into the bog all around her. She would get hypothermia and die. No, wait, she couldn't, could she? She knew she couldn't die, but she also knew that she was still capable of suffering. Just how bad would it feel to be in the clutches of hypothermia with a broken ankle and know that no matter how bad the pain and suffering got, she would never feel the release of death. She closed her eyes, trying her best not to think of the worst possibilities, just as the sound of gunfire erupted in the nearby buffer. She cried out again, holding both hands up in the air, doing the best she could around the heavy metal collar, but no one shouted out in reply. There was a pause in the gunfire. Maybe they'd heard her. Maybe they were trying to figure out a way to come down and rescue her. Crack! A bullet split open a rotted tree trunk just a few feet to her right. The woman threw her hands over her head and cowered in the dirt, feeling the metal of her collar digging into her skin tighter than ever. Please don't let it happen again, she prayed silently into the dirt. Encased in the collar around her neck were 4.5 kilograms of plastic explosives, each with a fragmentation layer pointed inwards towards her neck and head. With just a push of a button, they could 
She didn't want to think about it. All she knew was that she couldn't let that happen to her again. Looking through eyes bloodied with tears and rain, she saw, lying in the dirt just a few feet away from her, that infernal machine that was the sorry cause of all of this. The SCP Foundation has long stood as a bastion of hope, information, and security for the entirety of the human race. I'm sure you are well aware of the number of world-destroying catastrophes that have been averted by the hard-working researchers, agents, and other members of the Foundation, all without the general public having the slightest clue that something was amiss. With state-of-the-art holding cells all over the globe, and the sharpest minds humanity has ever produced working around the clock to ensure the protection of humanity, it is hard to imagine an entity that should not be contained by such a group. And yet, one such entity does exist. SCP-001 You may have come across the O5 Council by this point. While the SCP Foundation operates beyond the world's jurisdiction, the O5 Council operates beyond the Foundation's jurisdiction. The rules, methods, and protocols that are the cornerstone of securing, containing, and protecting countless entities around the world sometimes cannot be applied. Certain entities require us to temporarily abandon our humanity, abandon our sense of order, and step briefly into chaos for the greater good. I'm telling you all of this because SCP-001 is not held in a containment cell. There are no keypads, locked doors, observation windows, or health and safety forms. SCP-001 is not confined to a specific territory or even a specific country. For some SCPs, this is a practical necessity. Serpents that are hundreds of kilometers long swimming through the depths of the ocean, for example. But for SCP-001, it serves a more psychological purpose. The Scottish Highlands are the most remote part of the United Kingdom. Out there, you can walk for miles and miles without seeing a single soul. Open countryside, mountains, lochs, and forests surround you in all directions. The weather is harsh and unrelenting, the walking even more so. On a regular basis, walkers fall and break their legs, but without phone service or anyone else nearby to come and help, they can quickly disappear into the wilderness forever. The peat bogs of Scotland used to see human sacrifices in early settlements. Afraid of the ghosts and spirits that haunted the bogs, people would throw their family members into the deepest parts and watch them drown, hoping that whatever was lurking beneath wouldn't come and find them. So as the group of soldiers crested the top of the mountain and looked down beneath them to the eerie peat bogs obscured by mist and constant rainfall, you would forgive a shiver running up their spines. But of course, it didn't. That was because this group of soldiers were quite unlike any others that humanity has ever produced. All were nameless. None of them existed on any government databases, on any foundation databases, or even on the databases of the O5 Council itself. Their individual backgrounds, nationalities, and families were totally unknown to everyone other than themselves. Some had been tortured for years, others had been the torturers. The thing that united them, however, was their inhuman ruthlessness. A squad of eight soldiers utterly devoid of any sense of empathy. What could they possibly have to be afraid of in the peat bogs when they themselves were the evil ghosts walking through? But then, one person was afraid. A shiver ran up her spine as she looked over the edge and down into the murky black and green below. SCP-001-1 Around her neck was the bomb collar. Each of the eight soldiers surrounding her had a button mounted on a watch on the back of their wrists. At any moment, any one of them could hit the button, and all four and a half kilograms of plastic explosives would go off, sending her on an express trip to oblivion. Aside from the collar, she wore a plain white dress made of cotton. It was muddy and torn apart at the hem from days of walking through the Scottish wilderness. When she had first arrived, she had begged those around her to supply her with some warm clothes, something practical that would keep her comfortable and stave off any illness. Her requests, however, had not been acknowledged. Clutching in her trembling, outstretched hands was the machine, SCP-001-A. From its external experience, you would think it was nothing more than a wooden box. 
a perfect cuboid made from glossy dark wood. There were no symbols, no seams, no latches, nothing to indicate any method of operation. When the woman and the machine had first been delivered into the hands of the O5 Council, the researchers had spent weeks and millions of dollars trying to activate the machine. Their best scientists had scanned for every possible form of radiation and tried every method they could conceive to stimulate the box into opening. The ultimate failed attempt involved traveling to North Korea, where they negotiated placing the box 20 centimeters beneath a small nuclear warhead in return for granting the dictatorship key information on how to construct such a weapon. As we have established, the O5 Council operates beyond any kind of jurisdiction. Yet, at the bottom of the irradiated crater sat a perfectly intact wooden box that was cool to the touch and showed no signs of radioactivity. Only one person could interact with the box and unearth the secrets that were inside, SCP-001-1, the woman who stood trembling on the side of the mountain. A gun jabbed her in the back, forcing her to continue moving. She had asked the soldiers around her how much longer they had to walk that day, but none of them had replied. They never did. In the six years that she had been held hostage by this tiny militia, she had never once heard any of them say a word, not even to each other. Perhaps it was this telepathic understanding that seemed to run between them that unnerved her the most. Despite having never spoken to each other, each soldier seemed to understand the others intimately, and she had no doubt that any one of the eight would press the button on their wrist at a moment's notice. Sadly for her, she knew this from experience. The incident happened four years ago now, as the group was traveling through Patagonia. It was a day almost identical to the one she was having now. They had been transported by a helicopter flown by one of the eight into the middle of the wilderness. There, they had marched for days without saying a single word. Exhaustion had overtaken her legs, and she stumbled to the ground. Unfortunately for her, this happened slightly too close to the female soldier in front of her. Her knees hadn't even hit the ground before the blast went off. The woman didn't remember it, of course. How could she? In an instant, her mind had been utterly destroyed. What she did remember was the next 18 months as her body slowly healed itself one brain cell at a time. It wasn't so much like waking up from a nightmare, it was more constructing a nightmare slowly, alongside your consciousness as neuron by neuron your brain reformed itself, each individual cell screaming in terror at what had happened to it. They had her marching again before she was fit to move. Her motor controls had been all over the place, she had fallen over regularly, and the terror of having one of the soldiers push the button again engulfed her with every movement. And yet, perhaps the most incredible thing about SCP-001-1 was the fact that if you had asked her if she should have been held in this kind of containment, she would immediately have agreed without batting an eye. The only person capable of opening the box, she recognized how dangerous her existence was. Only she had seen into the mysteries of the box, only she had seen the horrors laid inside of it, and so only she could fully understand the gravity of their situation. They kept her on the move in order to keep the world safe. Had she been held in a containment cell, she would have posed too great of a risk. Out here in the wilderness, the entire planet was her containment cell, hidden in the middle of humanity's biggest haystack. No one, not even the O5 Council's central command, knew her location. The only people who were aware of it at any given time were herself and the eight soldiers surrounding her with guns drawn. So you can imagine her horror when, out of the sheets of rain, appeared the figure of a person carrying a rifle. The gunfire broke out before SCP-001-1 even had a chance to hit the ground. Bullets whizzed through her hair and cracked open the rocks all around her. The eight soldiers surrounding her dive for cover as the figure in the rain slumped to the ground lifeless. One of the soldiers grabbed the woman by her explosive collar and threw her behind a rock. Clasping her hands over her ears, she closed her eyes and waited for the fight to be over. No one was shooting, until a second figure emerged from the rain waving their arms wildly. Gunfire again. She wasn't quite sure what had happened, but all of a sudden, the woman was falling down the cliff. She had just been trying to shift her position to get deeper into cover, but she clearly hadn't noticed just how close to the edge she was. Down and down and down she fell until, with a crack in her ankle, she landed in the peat bog. Gunfire cracked on the mountain above her, 
but the only thought that filled the woman's mind was the terror that at any moment, the explosive collar around her neck would be detonated as one of the soldiers above her realized that she was missing. Seconds passed as the fear mounted in her chest. With each passing moment, the anxiety grew more and more crippling. She had to know. She had to prepare herself if it was about to happen. She had to use the machine and look into the future. Dragging herself forward through the muck, the woman snatched at the wooden box. It came alive at her touch. Different pieces shifted and opened beneath her fingers like some kind of elaborate puzzle. No one had taught her how to use this thing. It just happened. Her fingers would just dance across its surfaces, pushing and pulling, opening and closing, twisting and turning, and locking into place until all of a sudden, there it was. The box was wide open in front of her. Taking a deep breath and allowing the rain to fall on her head for another brief moment, the woman leaned forward and stepped into the box. On the trail above her, the gunfire stopped. Without a word of communication, the soldiers had deftly flanked the group of people who had approached them. In less than a minute, they neutralized each individual that came their way. In unison, the group of them walked up to the bodies, turning them over to examine their faces. They were nobodies, just a group of hikers lost in the rain. What had looked like a gun turned out to be nothing more than a walking pole. Five of them in total, none of them older than 24. Without words, the soldiers picked up the bodies and threw them over their shoulders as they scrambled their way down to the cliffs to the woman in the machine beneath them. Once they reached the bottom of the slope, they discarded the five bodies carelessly into the bog. Within a couple of hours, those five hikers would have sunk to the bottom and begun the long process of being embalmed into the depths. Perhaps someone would find them in a few thousand years' time as part of an archaeological dig, perhaps, but it was not their concern. The eight soldiers surrounded the women, guns drawn, and stared at her coldly. I used the machine, she told them. I used it without your permission. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if we even have any rules here, but I, I thought you should know. The soldiers continued to look at her in silence. The box was closed now, sitting back on her lap as it always was. I, I try to see my future. Anytime I've used the box before, I've looked at the lives of others. I've seen economic crashes, climate disasters, genocides, wars, love, and life, and death. I've done so at the hands of the O5 Council, as they've told me, given them the information and prevented the destruction of the world. Never once have I looked at my own future. The soldiers lifted her to her feet and tried to march her onwards, not listening to a word she was saying. Her broken ankle buckled and screamed beneath her. She had to hop to keep up with them. What other choice did she have? They would push the button if she didn't. She didn't know why she kept talking, but she did. For the first time, the machine lied to me. I saw that I was assassinated in 1987 in Cuba. It was years before I even built the box. Before any of this happened to me, I, I saw in my future that I no longer existed. That the machine no longer existed, but that future was years ago, and none of it happened. The machine doesn't lie, so why is it lying to me now? Why can't I see my own future? If any of the soldiers were paying attention, they didn't show it. They just continued to march her into the rain, as the bomb weighed heavily around her neck. Now go check out SCP-001 The Children, Orboros Cycle, and Insane SCP-001 Fight Gate Guardian vs. Scarlet King.